Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Tassine, and thanks to everybody who's uh, joined this uh, event this morning. Um, I'm Richard Shackleton. I'm the Deputy Head of Mission at the British Embassy in Budapest. Um, I'm also the lead here on climate change issues as a whole. Now, um, I've worked with Tassin and her colleagues in the past in my previous job in Finland, where we were looking at uh, climate justice and how climate change action uh, really affects people. And I think this morning's event is absolutely uh, front and centre in that debate. Um, I think we all know why we're talking about a transition for coal. Um, but as we go into COP26, which will be held in now less than uh, five weeks, um, we know that we've got to take action to meet our targets. But it's all very well, somebody in government saying you must, you must, and waving their fingers around. Um, but at the end of the day, this really does affect people, it affects the economy, it affects business, um, and we've got to find a way of taking into account all of uh, those voices as we move uh, confidently forward in this area. Um, I, I'm not sure that Tassine will always agree with me on these things. Um, we, we have a lively debate, um, but I do think that if we're talking about um, climate action, it's not just got to be good, which is what it should be in its, in its essence. It ought to be good for business as well, because that helps get us through the system where business can feel confident taking actions and that they don't feel penalised uh, against competitors, competitors and so on and so forth. But in the same way, people who've got to work and live in communities that have been uh, led by coal for a long time need to feel that there is a future and a way forward. So I hope I've set the context for the event. I know that there's a lot to talk about and I'm really pleased that we in the British Embassy here in Budapest and across the Central European region have been able to work with uh, Tassine and her colleagues in the centre um, up there in Glasgow actually um, and to really tease out these problems and to think about how we can take this action and take it forward. So I'll leave you there and thank you for all your hard work on this. I wish you all a very good uh, conversation today and I look forward to seeing some of the pathways forward that we can all take so that we know we can take action confidently and properly. Thanks ever so much. See you soon. Thank you very much, um, Richard, for your very, very warm uh, welcome to this event uh, today um, on behalf of everyone at the Centre for Climate Justice here at Glasgow Caledonian University. It's a, it's a, a huge honour and a pleasure to have been invited by the, the um, British Embassy in Budapest to be running this conference uh, today. Uh, and um, it, the, as, as Richard has said, um, this 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 event today is so timely as all eyes are on uh, COP26 taking place in just a few weeks and the, the urgency to bring down uh, carbon emissions is um, more vital than it has ever been before. So as Richard has said, our task uh, before us is to is to think through um, how we um, arrive at those um, uh, those uh, that that journey to to um, adjust transition in a manner that's fair and just uh, and equitable. But the way to do that is to help us all come together and think through th the lessons and experiences that we have uh, gone through here in the UK as we transitioned uh, out of coal. Um, 
and as in doing so this event today we will hear from um, a range of experts who have been uh, tracking how we have gone through this journey um, but also the challenges that has um, it has posed for us from uh, employment right through to um, uh, community impacts. Um, we're hoping at the end of this day that um, all of our, our deliberations and our conversations will lead to a, a policy brief. And as described by Richard there, what we're looking for are pathways forward, because ultimately we need to be all on this journey um, and arriving at that those um, that vision, um, the inspiration uh, and the motivation, which uh, we all appreciate it's different across different uh, countries. Um, it's, the challenge before us is, is truly uh, immense, but I, I do believe that by coming together uh, today and hearing from our experts today, um, we will get through um, this event and come out with something that's really meaningful uh, and, and tangible and something that we can reflect on. So the day um, is um, structured uh, in four uh, sessions. Um, we will be hearing about just transitions from coal, uh, our local legacies. We will be hearing about national drivers of change. We'll be hearing about European policy considerations and we'll be looking at lessons for uh, the future. And throughout the, the day, um, it's a fully packed out day. We will have experts uh, from across um, academia, uh, from trade unions, from industry, and it will be an opportunity to really reflect um, uh, those experiences that we have gone through here in the UK. But most of all, it's an opportunity um, for everyone to engage with um, uh, everyone who's on the panel, uh, really embrace the conversation and let's have a, 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 a meaningful uh, conversation. And this is the most exciting part, I think, of the day is being able to bounce um, uh, questions and really dig deep into some of the challenges that lie before us. So without further ado, um, I would again like to say a huge welcome to everyone who's um, joined us this morning. Um, and again, my huge uh, sincere appreciation for um, the British Embassy in Budapest and enabling this uh, event to take place. I'm Tassine Jaffrey. I'm the director of the Centre for Climate Justice and I will be your chair uh, for the, the day's session and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and just to say that my colleagues uh, from the Centre are uh, in the, the conversation in the chat box, um, Dr. Senan Mata, Dr. Michael Mikuelovich and Ailey Watson. Um, so we'll be here um, facilitating uh, the discussion throughout the day. So with that, what I would like to do is um, move straight over to our first uh, presentation uh, of the day um, on the session on just transition from coal, uh, local legacies. And we'll be joined by Mike McDonald, who is the negotiations officer at Prospect Union here in the UK. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Mike for his uh, for the very first presentation of the day. If you're there, Mike, welcome. Um, I'll just get my presentation up. Fantastic, thank you very much. Can everyone see that now? Right, um, so the presentation today is about making sense of a, of a just transition. I think it's important that we look at the UK experience and we are clear about what has worked in the UK and what are the lessons that we can apply. So to give some some background to this, um, when I became a trade union official, I never intended to be the expert in closing things down, but in in effect, that is what I've done in, in the coal sector. So very clearly, where were we in 1990, which may be 30 years ago, but at that stage, Britain's electricity sector was very closely integrated with deep coal mining within the United Kingdom. And we went very quickly from a 4 billion turnover industry. And, and checking that, that's nearly, that's 8.4 billion pounds of turnover in the coal industry in today's money in 1990 to the 
more or less total closure of the industry by the end of 2015. The other impact of that, of course, is that at that stage, between 75 and 80 percent of UK electricity production was fire, was fueled by domestically produced coal, and we've seen a similar reduction in the size of the coal-fired power station sector over over the past 30 years, with the final coal-fired power station in the UK. Uh, Ratcliffe upon Saw, due for closure in 2024. And that is an incredible shock for people of my generation who came into the workforce in the late 80s, early 90s, who we were more or less promised a job for life. This has had a huge impact on coalfield communities because the large power stations have been based in those communities and we've seen the loss of high skill, high value, high wage jobs so the impact is not just the loss of jobs it's the fact that these jobs supported a, huge, a very large supply chain and also they were a source of continued employment and retained young people in those areas and to be clear the coal-fired power stations that are closing are also within the same areas of the country so the hazards of not planning and i think without being unduly critical if we're looking about it too far the closure of the coal industry and the associated knock-on closure of power generation was not planned to anything more than how much could we offer the existing staff to leave the industry uh, on a voluntary basis and there were three impacts upon UK policy which I'd advise people to avoid the first was the loss of scarce skills needed for, for transition. So to give some background to this, I deal with electricity distribution companies that really struggle to find people with core engineering skills, sometimes in areas there where there are literally thousands of people in mining and power generation who had those skills in 1990. And what we've seen is a loss of those skills and a loss of the infrastructure required to support them. So instead of converting um, in professional institutions and colleges for further education, actually the course is left and the UK now faces a significant skill shortage, which employers and unions and government are having to work very hard to address. The second hazard of not planning was about the need to phase in replacement power. There's sometimes in our wish to achieve a just transition, there's almost the assumption that somehow new generation will just appear. The reality is that you need to plan this. And the closure of new generation needs, needs to be phased in such a way that we can transfer workers and we can use existing infrastructure. And the final point to someone who lives in a coal field is that I see on a daily basis the social costs of lower productivity caused by the closure of coal mining and power generation. And the impact on the, on the area is, is significant. So there's a need to be very careful and considered about how you attract new employers into the area and how you encourage small and medium enterprises to take advantage of what is a very skilled, a very hard working workforce. And the impact otherwise is that you see a drift of younger and skilled people out of the area with a consequent detrimental impact on future economic growth. So what are the foundations of just transition? It's very easy to talk about it. And I think, uh, as we said in the introduction, we can be very pious about the need to, to transition, but actually getting this right and getting the benefits for communities and the wider economy requires us to have some firm foundations. And I'll take three firm foundations for a just transition that I have seen I think will make a significant difference for changes that we see in Eastern and Central Europe. And they cover the areas of skills, they cover the areas of phase change, and they cover the partnerships for replacement growth. So looking at skills, there's an importance to recognise that coal-based skills are valuable. I don't imagine anyone in this audience finds anything controversial about that, but I have found that many employers have a very detrimental view of coal, fat, coal mining and coal-fired power generation and actually neglect 
that these are some of the most skilled people within the within coalfield communities in the UK. And actually, it is a tragedy of economic policy that the Britain didn't take the full advantage of the core industrial skills of the highly developed management skills. And frankly, if you looked at the change within mining and power generation in the early 90s, actually that skill, understanding how to transform an industry and how to adapt to change. So the first point is that we need to build the professional core. So as we transition out of coal, is to make sure that we maintain the professional skills of people who work in the sector and give them the capacity to expand. And that sounds very wordy, but actually extending that into reality is someone who works as a fitter in a power coal-fired power station is actually a very good candidate to work in advanced manufacturing, renewable um, electricity generation, or to work on developing energy networks. Actually, they've probably got 85 to 90% of the professional skills. And actually, we should be aiming to use the rundown of the power sector as an ability to build on those skills and to give people the core skills that enable them to contribute to the new economy. The consequences of not doing that and persuading those people to either retire or go into low skilled work is actually we hold back economic growth in the areas affected by change. And we also reduce our ability to, to bring in low carbon electricity. The third point is to protect the supply chain. And to be clear, when I look within the Yorkshire, Nottinghamshire, Derbyshire coal field, one of the saddest impacts of change within mining and the power sector has been a loss of a very vibrant um, supply chain of small and medium sized companies that grew, that offered high skilled, high wage work. And it's important that as we transition out of coal, that we enable the supply chain to adapt and to contribute to servicing new smart power networks to contribute to the work on solar and wind and if if nations decide to develop their nuclear sectors to develop those skills as well and one of the tragedies of the change in the uk in the early 90s where we moved from coal to gas generation was actually the uk lost those highly skilled design uh, and in research roles and also lost a lot of the supply chain by buying in technology from overseas and the most important point to these communities is to prevent the loss of skilled young people and the reality was that the power and coal industries did allow people in coal field areas who were graduates it offered a, a very attractive and challenging career and actually was a basis for attaining skills entrepreneurial expertise and a sense of the desire to manage change was retained within the sector and I'm sure other speakers later today will go into far more detail how the loss of young and skilled people has a detrimental impact on economies which then struggle to recover from industrial change. So then when we look into the area of phase change and this is something that we'll get, I can bring out. I won't go into great detail today, but something I, I'm more than happy to elaborate on if people have questions. Is actually the process of building up decommissioning skills. I know that sounds rather strange, but the process of closing mines, of closing power stations, is a highly skilled process, and it's about developing those skills within the industry, and actually enabling those individuals to become experts at how we decommission plant but as there's a, a colleague of mine pointed out someone who can take apart a power station is actually very good at building up an energy network the second issue about phasing change is to avoid running into a need to to retire old capacity but is actually to reuse the skills of individuals and also to reuse the infrastructure I think the purpose of a just transition is to recognise that people will still use a large amount of electricity, in fact, as we shift away from fossil fuels in heating and transport, probably more electricity than any time in the history of the world, is to use that infrastructure. And a lot of the, lot of the mines and power stations that are due to close actually have very good infrastructure 
And I think the third point about phase change is to take a holistic view. The task here is not how do we persuade people who work in an old coal fired power station to either retire or take low skilled work is actually to use the wider infrastructure and to use the, the ability we have for transport and distribution of power to actually come up with a more modern and more efficient energy network. And that's one issue that the UK has struggled with because it requires a coordination of regulation and industrial policy. But there are huge benefits to a just transition and to developing an efficient low carbon economy if we can modernise and upgrade distribution networks. And clearly there's a lot that can be done to enable the efficient use of electricity and to enable industry to grow if we can take the skills of people who work in coal, whether in mining it or converting it into electricity to modernize and upgrade our distribution networks. And because it's a very technical issue, it's something that, ne that becomes neglected, but it is important that economies in change do consider that. Certain final bit for a, a trust transition is also developing partnerships for replacement growth. And this is something we've done in the past decade with the closure of coal fired power stations. There was some work done with the closure of the last three mines in the UK. And I have to say from a prospect point of view that our, our members who tend to be managers and professional engineers actually as individuals have gone through that process and have generally either been at an age where they were they were due to retire or they've been successfully redeployed into other sectors of the economy so typically into renewable generation but also into energy networks and there's a long list of other things so when i've spoken to the british department of work and pensions they did raise their eyebrows when we went through destinations when two two of our members who work for UK coal were actually retrained as priests which I'm not suggesting is a, a foundation of policy but actually shows that the people we're dealing with actually have a wide range of interpersonal skills as well as technical skills so what has worked well in the experience of prospects of getting our members redeployed and enabling their employers to continue to contribute to the local economy. And the first point is to work with stakeholders to promote local solutions. It's very much an issue of being clear what the options are for the locality, what other factors are there, what other industries are there. And some of the worst examples of ill-planned replacement growth have been the insertion of businesses that actually are not appropriate. And I have to say, to some extent, some of the work to introduce distribution centres or call centres has not been the best way of retraining and redeploying ex-coal miners. And actually, when you look in South Yorkshire at the growth of the coal centres, actually they've employed very few people from the coal industry and actually have not provided the high quality work that their, their children are, were looking for. The second issue is to develop employer networks to reskill staff. And that's something that prospects and the other unions are involved with in the UK at the moment. So as we close, uh, the last two um, coal-fired power stations, which is West Burton and Ratcliffe, we've already developed employer networks to redeploy people, those scarce skills, and actually to give people in the rundown of those power stations that will run, they will run and be decommissioned over the next two to five years, is actually to give individuals who have mid-career a chance to develop new skills that make them more effective to work in renewable generation or to work in energy networks. The most important point, and you would expect me as a trade union official to say this, is to engage unions to get realistic change. It's very important that whenever I've been involved in a closure of a major industrial plant, be it a coal mine or a power station or a distribution business hub, the reality that people don't really know what their skills are and don't know what their opportunities are and therefore we need a process that engages with individuals and other employers and government to actually get the best value for people and my experience has been that people displaced by industrial change have a sadly negative view of their value to other employers and actually when you get into the process 
then these individuals actually can contribute a lot more to the local economy and can get higher, higher paid and higher skilled work. And it's a process of working with individuals and employers to deliver that. The benefit of the economy is that is how we get economic growth. I would say, and I'd say as you'd expect me to say this, there's a lot of experience within the UK and there are people within Britain who are highly experienced at both the technical and social impacts of managing change and I'd encourage colleagues to use that expertise and experience there is a lot we've learned a lot about the transition away from coal in the united kingdom and i think it, it is something we are keen to share with the with the rest of europe to demonstrate the pitfalls and how change can be used to generate stronger and more efficient economies very very briefly the good practice and the model of good practice is the closure of the cotton power station in North Nottinghamshire. So it was cotton was built in the 1960s to use coal in the newer part of the Nottinghamshire coal field, which closed eventually closed by 2015, but largely closed in the 1990s. The power station closed unexpectedly early. So what we needed to do was to make a decision at the point of closure and one option would have been to increase the redundancy terms and effectively bribe people into exiting the workforce what the three unions prospect united and gmb did with edf who were the employer is actually we decided to do something different we were aware of the skill shortages elsewhere within the energy sector and we looked at the age profile and realized frankly that paying people in their early 50s to retire was not in the best interest of the individuals and wasn't in the best interest of the local economy. So we went through a process of redeploying skilled staff into areas of low carbon generation. And when we started the process, there's a level of skepticism. I have to say much to my satisfaction, every single prospect member who works at Cotton Power Station who wanted employment, we eventually managed to place we also that helped the suppliers to build links with renewables businesses and other and distribution companies to replace the work they'd lost. And to put in perspective, Cotton Power Station was a 90 million pound turnover business. So its impact upon the local economy of it closing is significant. We also made sure that we retained the site infrastructure. So it was potentially a site for a modern um, a fusion research center, but it's very much using the infrastructure, which is an excellent site for renewable generation and low carbon generation is to retain it in a, in a state where it can be reused and to avoid a hefty level of investment in new infrastructure somewhere else in the UK. And finally, we developed a highly skilled change team who will be used in other projects within EDF and have the skills and capacity to train and advise other companies who are going through the same process. So in conclusion, uh, the future after coal can protect communities. It can actually be used to increase skills by modernizing and updating the extensive skills of people who work in coal mining and power generation. And it can be used to improve energy infrastructure so we can meet the low carbon objectives of a just transition. But let's be clear, it needs work. And if we're to deliver an effective just transition, you need to work with other employers and unions and local government to get this delivered. Thank you very much for your time. I'm more than happy later to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, for a wonderful, uh, precise and very clear presentation on the journey that that the UK has gone through um, in our in our transition and it just strikes me very clearly that this is um, it's not just only a huge challenge but it requires multiple stakeholders working together to get our framework correct and our perspectives correct um, 
And I think the other thing that's really striking from your presentation is your reference to um, not just the younger generation, but also um, protecting the jobs of those who are um, slightly older, the 50 plus, so that no one loses out in this process of, of transitioning um, out of coal. I'm sure we will have lots and lots of questions uh, for you, Mike. Um, and I just want to remind everyone um, that after the presentations, if you would like to um, uh, ask any questions to any of our presenters, um, put them in the, the chat box and we will monitor and and um, ask those questions so point for reflection. But for now, Mike, I'll, I'll bring you back into the conversation shortly, but I want to thank you for your, uh, your presentation. Um, what I would like to do now is invite Dr Ewan Gibb, um, who's a lecturer in global inequalities at the University of Glasgow, um, to, to give us a sense of direction as to how this journey of transition fits with reference to um, the the equality and in, with reference to inequality and equity and fairness um, uh, and how it fits uh, in that whole landscape of um, dealing with our transition uh, with reference to 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 ensuring that that no one is is left behind. So with that, I would like to um, invite Ewan to um, give his presentation. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Can I just check that you can see my screen here? OK. Um, yes, we can, Ewan. Go ahead. You can see it, yeah. OK. Yep. Thanks very much. Could um, you just put it into slideshow, please? Of course. Thank you. If we look on the right hand the side of the slide, we see um, Long Annet Power Station in Fife, which is a very important location in the story of the end of Scottish deep coal mining. And the story of changes to Scottish energy uh, are largely told in a, a celebratory tone in contemporary Scottish politics, particularly the achievement of approaching 100% equivalent of Scotland's electricity through sure renewable sources. And Longana is central to that outcome. The, Station closed in 2016, which effectively brought the end to the significant use of coal in Scotland's economy. And this took place 14 years after Long Annet Mine, the last of the drift mines which were dug underneath the power station to supply it directly with coal from the Fife and Clark Manager coal fields, also closed. This brought down the end of Scottish deep coal mining, a, a centuries-long historical drama. Sorry, yeah, Ewan, can I interrupt? I think your slide, your, your slides have gone off screen. Have they? Can you see them? Can you see them now? Hang on. Yes, we can. You're right at the beginning again. OK. We, yeah. Yep. So this was the culmination of a, a long process. Uh, Post-war Scottish coal mining peaked in the late 1950s and areas of the coal field had experienced sustained contraction even before that, certainly from the beginning of the nationalised coal industry in the UK in 1947. The core argument of this presentation is that these changes were managed very differently over time. In particular, I'd argue that the transition out of coal was, uh, was managed relatively successfully and benignly from the late 1940s until the late 1970s and far more harshly um, and with much graver consequences from after this. And what I term the moral economy, the negotiation of closures with trade unions, the protection of workers' economic security and the provision of employment in alternative sectors in the coal field between the 40s and the 70s was crucial in marking this differentiation. And I think there are lessons for our countries now experiencing a coal transition in those earlier experiences, as well as negative ones in the later experience in Scotland and the UK as a whole. The Scottish coalfields span across the 
thin waste of the country that's sometimes referred to as the central belt from Ayrshire in the southwest to Fife in the northeast. Coal was crucial to Scotland's experience of industrialisation and the concentration of the overwhelming majority of its population around these areas. Typically, the, the coal fields are made up of settlements which either owe their foundation to industrialisation and coal mining in the 19th century or their expansion and current social structure to that experience, followed by sustained contraction from the middle of the 20th century. So we see that coal employment uh, peaked in, as I said before, in the late 1950s at 82,000. I, I think it's really important to realise that the overwhelming majority of Scottish coal miners lost their jobs before the late 1970s. So, so this period I attribute to relatively successful management also accounted for most of these closures and most of these job losses. There were only around 20,000 miners employed in Scotland uh, by the late 1970s, but nevertheless, uh, the removal of the last coal mines and, and, and the industrial structure associated with the industry had lasting ongoing consequences that are still being navigated. And we can see this in a, a case study of Lanarkshire, which was the area I, I studied most thoroughly in my research. Lanarkshire is the area to the east of Glasgow, which was the centre of Scotland's industrialisation in the 19th century and was the largest coal field in Scotland until the middle of the 20th century. And what we see here is a, an overview of male employment. And I think we see that picture of a relatively well-managed transition between the early 50s and early 70s here. So coal mining, which is obviously an overwhelmingly male industry, contracts by over 16,000 jobs between the early 50s and the early 70s. The overwhelming majority of mining jobs are lost in this time period. Yet, yeah, effectively, the, the combined employment of mining, metal manufacturing and engineering, the leading industrial sectors, remains around stationary. Um, and that's due to the increase in engineering mm. employment, which was an outcome of regional, regional policy and the direction of uh, investment to coal fields by UK government. It's after that time period in the early 1980s that we start to see marked contraction. Comparable statistics are not available for subsequent decades, but it's safe to say that by the 2010s, overall industrial employment would count for less than 10% of the total workforce. So what does this term mean, moral economy, that I've referred to as having been important to understanding management of economic change between the 1940s and the 1970s. During the first three decades of nationalisation, uh, pit closures were negotiated and were managed carefully by policy makers in, in the UK government, the Scottish office and by the managers of the nationalised coal industry. This centred on customs at the colliery level. Closures were broadly agreed with or negotiated with trade unions. Miners directly affected were provided with alternative employment, often within the coal industry itself, but also importantly, regional labour markets were stabilised by the provision of employment in alternative industries, such as manufacturing sectors, which may have used jobs, uh, may have used skills that were developed in the coal industry effectively. These experiences began early. Uh, they began when coal mining employment overall was still expanding, but local economies such as the Shots area of eastern Lanarkshire were experiencing sustained contraction. We can see on this slide quotes from um, the Abe Moffat, who was the president of the Scottish Miners Union from the late 40s and early 50s, where on the one hand, he accepted the broad principle of the reorganisation of Scottish colliery closures. They told a union conference in 1947 that we had to reorganise the most inefficient in, in industry this country had. We must ensure that this reorganisation is carried out as speedily as possible. Yet three years later, during the closure of bait and colliery in shots in 1950, he starkly 
told the industry managers that the board needed to realise they were discussing not just a mining engineer's opinion, but the social life of a mining village. And these sentiments carried over, uh, certainly into the 1960s. So when Alex replaced Abe as head of the Scottish area of the NUM of the National Union of Mine Workers in 1961, and a large closure programme was announced in Scotland, he starkly said that the government could shut down all the pits in Scotland if every miner had a reasonable job to go to. And this principle was enunciated in some oral history interviews I recorded during the 2010s that reflected on the experience of deindustrialization. John Slavin, whose father um, began working at the Caterpillar factory that was built atop a derelict mining village in Tannock Side in North Lanarkshire during the late 1950s, explained that this was, sim this was symbol symbolic of a new future, a new industrial future for the area. He said, this large new factory, which had been brought to North Lanarkshire through the provision of incentives by the UK government, looked large, it looked American, it was building brilliant tractors that were sold all over the world. Then he, he juxtaposed that to working an old decrepit pit whose seam was running out. Pat Egan, uh, a miner from North Lanarkshire also, who subsequently relocated to Fife to work at the Long Annick complex, and who was uh, one of the last miners in Scotland, he was among those made redundant in 2002, also explained his understanding of the development of the coal industry as he saw it in the 1970s. He said that miners were accepting that the, the long-term future of the industry meant accepting closures, it meant accepting a planned transition, it meant even in some cases accepting relocating. But what was essential here was planning and a sense of order in the transition and a sense that organised workers had a voice in the future of the industry. And it's that aggressive shift away from moral economy practices during the early 1980s and the pursuit instead of an aggressive form of anti-trade union politics within the Scottish Coal Board under Director Albert Wheeler before the beginning of the miners' strike in 1984, which is important to understanding the impact of subsequent closures. This was also part of a broader shift in Britain's political economy. It was accompanied, for instance, by the dismantling of regional policy machinery and the toleration of divestment and closure of large factories such as the Caterpillar plant in 1987 and the abandonment of a commitment to national energy, a national energy economy through the increasing use of coal imports in those areas of the, the economy which did remain reliant on coal. It was the triggering of a series of contentious colliery closures then and the manner in which those colliery closures were pursued, which is key to understanding the industrial action of 1984-5. One example of this was the closure of Cardowan Colliery, Lanarkshire's last pit in 1983. Financial incentives were offered to the workforce in, area, in, in, in manners perhaps quite redolent of some of the experiences that might discussed, to accept the closure of a coking coal colliery that supplied local steelworks and divide the workforce in the in the process. Instead of collective negotiation with the workforce's trade union representatives, management led by Wheeler made a cash offer, as they described it, to individual workers. And one trade union official responded to this by describing the closure as a ludicrous case that such large reserves should be sterilised for purely political reasons. The long-term consequences of closures at Cardowan, those that came before and those that came after the, the strike are important in understanding the current political economy of the coal fields. The 1984-5 strike then was provoked by these changes in industry governance and the legacy of the strike continues through the distrust of authority and the current campaign for a pardon for Scottish miners who were convicted uh, of strike-related offences, which 
looks to have been successful and have been accepted by by the Scottish government following an independent review into policing during the strike. Its persistence, the persistence of deindustrialisation, is demonstrated in lower rates of economic activity, health outcomes, and educational attainment inequalities. We see the erosion of comparatively stable middle income employment, especially for manual workers in, in the coal field. And another element of this, which I think is important when we're thinking about environmental sustainability and the sustainability of local economies, is the rise of dormitory settlements, which is a phenomenon across the British coal fields and the Scottish coal fields. It's particularly visible in Lanarkshire, where one third of the current workforce leaves local authority boundary each day in its daily working commute. Essentially, Lanarkshire is increasingly a, a local economy that's dependent on households who actually find their employment and then white collar jobs in Glasgow, Edinburgh, or large cities and, and elsewhere in the country. Deindustrialisation is also continuing. Um, there was a failure in the, in the 90s and 2000s associated with the pursuit of microelectronics investment and at the moment there's particular frustration with the Scottish government's pursuit of policies which are aimed at reindustrialization around renewables but which have been thwarted in effect by the dependence on large multinational dominated supply chains in the renewable sector so that achievement in renewable electricity generation is not being matched in terms of the anticipated employment benefits. So to summarise then, how we manage coal closures is important, even in perhaps especially when we regard them as inevitable. I think there are positive lessons of colliery closures in Scotland between the 1940s and the 1970s. The offer of dialogue with the workforce and their representatives, the protection of the economic security of workers directly affected, but also the reinforcing of local labour markets with alternative industrial activities were all very important. And making coal closures actually a comparatively successful economic period. The impact of closures during the 1980s and 1990s when this approach was abandoned have been long lasting. In a Scottish context, and I think worldwide as we're looking at moves towards renewable energy investment, we need to consider how economic opportunities will be achieved in this transition. Perhaps also to understand importantly that in sectors such as wind power, employment opportunities broadly lie in manufacturing, but not in um, generation itself. Thank you. Thank you. You in for the presentation. Um, may I just, um, Valentine? I can see you're on on video. Would you mind just switching your video off just now while we're we're going to the Q and A session? I'm sorry, we have a bit of a, a technical hitch here. Um, Ewan, I want to thank you uh, for your for your presentation. I'm wondering, Senan, could we have um, our our speakers back uh, on uh, on stage? Um, and we will be joined also by Bill Adams um, from the TUC Trade Union Congress, who is the regional secretary uh, for Yorkshire and the Humber region. And I would just like to invite everyone, um, if you'd like to ask any questions of our uh, experts um, for the panel, if you could please put those questions uh, into, into the chat box. So I'm wondering if we can have invite Mike McDonald and Ewan and Bill Adams, uh, if you can um, get, come back on screen. And Valentine, would you mind uh, uh, switching off your, your video if, if you can hear us? Okay. 
So while we're waiting for um, the the chat box to populate with with questions, I want to thank you all for your different perspectives. And and I'm wondering, Bill, now that you've joined us for 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 Q and A, and and very warm uh, uh, welcome uh, to to this conversation as um, uh, in your role um, for Yorkshire and and Humber regions. And it was really interesting to hear the two conversations um, uh, from Mike and Ewan. And I think what what I'm hearing is uh, at, from the outset, um, this isn't just about um, transitioning for those who are employed in the sector, but also protecting the supply chain. It's come very, very clear from what Mike had said, because it's not just loss of that 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 small community, but how it impacts um, it, 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 multiple um, communities um, and and region actually um, as a whole. And and interesting from what um, you and you were saying there about. How the, you were describing a well-managed transition. Um, I, I seem to that was that was coming through from the experiences in Scotland. Um, that miners were accepting um, some of these changes that were taking place, but also interestingly about the financial incentives um, to do so and how that how that didn't work. So I'm wondering, um, Bill, if you could give us your reflections on um, you and your experiences of of the amalgamation of the different challenges before us how do you see transition uh working or or not working what what do you think are the the, the big ticket items that need to be considered um as as we move forward because it seems a mul very complex kind of like process okay thanks <clears throat> thanks jeffrey and um I'm going to apologise in advance if you hear some rather obnoxious noises. Unfortunately, I'm having my bathroom done and the workmen are in the house, so hopefully I can get through my piece before they start again. Uh, I thought you and, and Mike's um, contributions were brilliant. Um, Mike obviously uh, gives some real good examples for colleagues who may be starting off the process of closing the coal industries across uh, in, in different parts of the world. I think Ewan gave a really good um, examples of, you know, uh, social change in uh, before the 1980s where, you know, unions and government and employers sat down together and negotiated settlements. And I think we broke away from that in the 80s and the 90s when the coal industry and in my particular case in, in Yorkshire where we had around 60,000 miners um, and then, you know, probably double that in supply chains were basically thrown on the scrap heap um, without any uh, consideration of uh, what those new jobs might uh, might bring. And that has led to, you know, 30 years of uh, desolation in lots of areas of my region, Yorkshire, uh, where communities have been uh, not just left behind, but, you know, abandoned. Um, so the new issues uh, for us, uh, for trade unions, are not particularly around coal. I think Britain has a particular example on warnings for others who were starting to contract the coal industries of how not to do it, uh, particularly, you know, from the 1980s onwards. Uh, I think, you know, the, the lack of social dialogue between government and unions uh, really emphasise the point that you know you do need you do need plans if you want to transition away. And whilst I welcome transition to clean energy, um, I, you know the closure of the coal industry devastated uh, Yorkshire and other parts of the country, um, and that's lasted over a long period. So my view now, you know, as we transition towards COP and uh, 2030 um, is that in our region we have we still have lots of issues around um, certain industries cement steel glass production uh, energy production we still have lots of um, people directly affected uh, by climate change and the rush to reach the Paris agreements and the kind of net zero economy that uh, we all want to see. What we've done quickly, Jaffrey, we've set up an independent climate commission uh, 
in Yorkshire that brings together politicians, uh, business and unions and third sector like Friends of the Earth, etc. and different climate action groups. And we're producing a action plan for presentation at the COP in November. Um, that's that's one kind of thing that we have been doing and we've been able to uh, harness cross party support for that. Uh, what are the unions doing? Well, we want to train our representatives in uh, industries that are going to be directly affected, but also those that may not think at this point that their jobs will be affected, but at least train up our reps in what climate change means and what that means for their members and the people that work in those industries. And also think a bit wider about, you know, things like refitting, transport across the region. There's a whole host of uh, issues that we need to really get together and support each other. And I've been calling for many years now, it's no secret, for the government to be much more active on social dialogue than it has been. And there seems to be a cry from industry for that to happen. Uh, there seems to be a cry from business, particularly at the larger level, for that to happen. And we want to play our part in that as as workers and unions. And um, I think in Yorkshire, we've been leading the way in terms of uh, throughout England. We have our unions uh, almost agreeing, uh, which is uh, which is something that's um, quite unique. We do have a little phrase on the on the outer edges, but you know we're more or less agreed that. What we have to do is prepare our workplace reps to be able to discuss and negotiate proper agreements right from secure employment skills early retirement income security and you know all the issues that have been mentioned by my previous colleagues uh, that's just a quick round up and i've noticed he started knocking again Geoffrey. so i'll i'll i'll, I'll call it there and um, take any questions from uh, from the audience thank you thank, thank thank you bill for that um we've got one question that that's come into the chat box um I guess it's that one about this. I mean, what I'm hearing from all the presentations that this needs to be a considered and a managed process, right? Um, and in terms of that, getting that management correct in a way is how do we communicate those plans to those who will be or could be uh, affected in this in this transition uh, out of coal. Um, it could be the perspective from, from different stakeholders who have a role in managing the, the transition, or it could be from a different perspective. But I guess it is absolutely critical and vital that that we're very clear on that on that vision, what it might mean, and get to get that buy-in from everyone that's going to be affected. I'm wondering, Mike, if I could uh, turn to you, um, if you have any thoughts on the, the communication um, around this agenda. Yeah, thanks, Asin. Yeah, it, it, it's a really interesting question because you're dealing with a multiplicity of, of audiences. And I think the important point is to keep the message simple and articulate. So what we've done is always at the start of a closure process is to speak to all the staff and to be clear, this is what we're doing. This is how we're going to work with you. We need your input. Actually, we're going to redeploy you. You need to tell us what you can do and what you're willing to learn. You then, you do then be clear about the message to other employers, to the local governments and national government. So in the case of Cotton, we went and we spoke. The company and I, the, co the station manager and I met Bayes. I have to say they met us separately. Uh, and they did comment, oh, it was quite interesting to see the union and management um, saying pretty much the same thing. And with with other employers, we've run individual workshops to try and find out what they're after. It's an important, it's one of those communication exercises that you, you're trying to find out what other stakeholders want. So if you're trying to redeploy people, what do they want? And then it's a longer term discussion in terms of policy with um you know business bodies the regional tuc so to be fair you know to be clear bill and his colleague in east midlands have been incredibly helpful in this to actually be clear what the opportunities are 
and what practical measures we need. So, you know, we, we I've had several discussions with the DWP and actually sometimes those have been quite harsh uh, at the beginning to say, well, your, your sentiment is right, but asking these people whether they want to drive a forklift truck in a warehouse probably is not the best way of using their skills. And I think it's very much about adapting your communication and trying to make sure that you find out what other people want out of the process so you can tailor your message and persuade them to get on board. So I think it it is it's being bold and it's being innovative because if you don't, you will fail. Thank you, Mike, for that. And and I guess it's about uh, a sense of honesty as well and being very clear um, because we can't hide, um, you know, that change that will take place on the ground. It's it's the reality check. And and I'm just reflecting on your point there about what do people want and what they want to get out of this this process um, to make um, make that a successful uh, transition. I was wondering, you know, if I could bring you into the conversation because what what we're also hearing um, and from from history tells us that a full recovery uh, from the collapse of of the coal industry has not been realised for many communities. And and, and I appreciate you were giving some uh, a very successful kind of like story there of what's happened uh, in Scotland. Um, but what how do we get through that um the challenge of meeting needs with what is is offered and what happens if we're not able to meet that need how do we um get to a full and successful recovery from from transition and and will there be winners and losers and is that a realistic way to approach this that there will be winners and losers or there will not be any losers in this you and i'm wondering if you could reflect on that a little bit well, I mean, clearly there have been losers in the last 40 years of, of coal transitions and Mike's given some quite detailed examples of that. And I think I've given maybe a bit more of a, a broad brush story here and Bill's referred to some of the the ongoing intergenerational costs of that. Um, in terms of the, the more specific question, I think there was a couple of things I wanted to say at slightly different levels. Um, I think that when these experiences feel like they've been imposed on individual workers, communities and industries from the outside and that they're much more likely to be seen as in sheerly negative terms. And I think um, some level of involvement in dialogue, but also in the generation of a, a, a bigger macro political, macroeconomic vision of what the future should look like that has some sort of political space for these communities and these interests and, and, and that are articulated in those terms is very important. But I also think it's very important that that is attached to quite specific ideas of how these skills, achievements and forms of social organisation and economic organisation are going to be used in the new economy. Otherwise, it can come across as sentimental and fluffy and, and actually ineffective. And I think it can actually be naive. And I do think the assumption that renewables would be an easy way to provide industrial employment without um, providing uh, mechanisms and, 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 and thinking about, for instance, you know, if you're going to use resources in Scotland and you're going to receive sub subsidies from government, should there be conditions attached to that that involve reusing workers from Long Annet Power Station or elsewhere? That's an example when we've got large wind farms being built off the coast of Fife with relatively little local input, we need to think about is that a just transition? Um, it might be an important achievement in environmental terms, but when it's coming alongside the failure to use local skills and to develop effective industrial sectors and high economic rewards being enjoyed by um, multinational multinational companies that are not providing employment in Scotland for the most part or parts of our electricity industry that were, were privatised a long time ago at great public cost. We, we do need to, I think we need to think about those dynamics as well. Thank you, Ewan, for that. And I just want to pick up on your point there that, and a very prominent point there that you made there about failure to, to use uh, uh, local skills and, and and it's that sense of struggle um, um, about you know 
what, what, how do we protect um, the, the, the economies, um, the, the livelihoods of those who are going to who are on the fallout of of those um, not being redeployed, um, and I guess it's that one that you know in in our history and our transition out, we didn't have that vision about how to 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 use those those local skills and employment. So, Bill, I'm wondering, as we as we look um, to our to our neighbours um, in uh, on on the continent, what 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 do you what would you say are the, are the biggest things that that need to be borne in mind when it comes to um, this fear, I guess, of, of transitioning away from coal and how do we um, ensure that local skills are, are used um, and uh, deployed in allied industries, perhaps in the region? What, what, what are the big things that need to be borne in, in a plan, in a management plan from the outset, I think? not as a consequence, but right from the very beginning of this conversation. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. I think, you know, if you get to a position where a plant, whether it be coal or energy or glass or cement factory is on the, is getting ready to be closed, I think we've lost, you know, a, a great advantage in terms of how we deal with the transition. And I think what, I, what I'd be hoping for is a, a long term industrial plan. Uh, similar to what you know we've seen in in Germany, for example, with the DGB and the coal industry, you know, a plan from uh, a number of years ago right through to 2038. And one of the things I think that workers uh, are, are afraid of is the drastic lo loss of income that redundancy brings. And you know, what I think is essential in any kind of transition is that people have a uh, a path to follow, which means that either they're going to reach the end of their working life in that particular industry, or if they don't, if they if they're not going to, and they fall a few years short, that they've got income security, and the people that are actually left behind have a proper structured training plan. And that's that's a, an example of what has happened in Eastern Germany in the coal industry, and you know for that you need. Uh, a government strategy, you need a long term investment from the state and you also need to bring on the employers and the, uh, the trade unions and the communities that rely on these jobs. It's too late once they announce redundancies. And, you know, I've got many examples of successful redundancy uh, negotiations, as Mike has pointed out, where the, the worst excesses of people losing the jobs have been mitigated. But in, if you look at the coal industry in Britain, that didn't really happen uh, from the 80s onwards. And so all that economic insecurity and the devastation of the communities took place. So for me, you know, what we need is a more grown up approach to social dialogue in this country. Realise that, you know, workers do have a stake and they're not just there to be paid off and bribed or given us, you know, a sum of money to go away. Uh, there, there needs to be long term planning in what those industries will have to do to either reposition themselves for the modern economy or some alternative uh, economic change, uh, which might require X amount of the workforce to be reskilled or, you know, given some kind of uh, economic security in, in retirement. So, that I think the social dialogue does not exist in the UK the way it does in some European countries. And I've got numerous examples of that, you know, from being on the ETUC uh, Climate Change Committee, where my colleagues think the government hasn't spoken to you about this, you know. It's just beggar's belief that there's 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 not that kind of social dialogue across across the UK widely. And that's not to say that some employers aren't very good at it. They are, but I think when you're talking long-term industrial strategy, it's got to contain the government and there's got to be a proper long-term industrial strategy as to how people are going to transition to net zero. If you don't have that, you've got problems coming down the line. I'll give you a little example about, you know, Ewan was talking about the wind farms off, off Fife and, you know, we've all heard of it kind of disputes in the in, in the yards there with the GMB workers. 
we have a Siemens factory in Hull, which makes the blades uh, for the offshore wind in the Humber. And the, the head of the LEP, the, the local enterprise partnership, the, you know, the, the kind of business driving force in the LEP, said to me that, you know, the, the stanchions on which these wind um, propellers stand are sailed in from Indonesia. And the fact that we have a steelworks 25 miles away from Hull with a train line, uh, they easily make these um, things, uh, is a tragedy. And you know, part of what Ewan was saying, you know, it's okay having wind farms out in the North Sea with you know a number of highly skilled um, engineers servicing those things. It's the manufacture of them, the maintenance charge that we need to provide the jobs for engineers and the subsidiary industries. So that's where the lack of long term planning comes in. And the fact that, you know, we should be making those agreements before we embark on closing down wholesale industries. Thank you, Bill, for that. And I'm just I'm reaching out to my, my colleagues who are who are joined as our, our, our delegates. If you've got uh, any questions you would like to pose to our, our experts, please do put, put them in the chat box. I understand that this is a, a very kind of like sensitive and challenging uh, co conversation. It's not easy to to have, um, you know, to 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 pose questions on it because it is, it is you know, hugely difficult. But but while I've got um, the opportunity, Mike, I, I want to just bring you in a little bit and and reflect back on what Bill was saying about that social dialogue. Why is that social dialogue not there? Who's going to drive that social dialogue? And is it not? Is it should it be the role of of government to drive that dialogue if it's in their interest to, um, you know, if it is to 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 push forward on our in our transition. Uh, to net zero. Um, and th the other thing that, that relates to that in terms of pushing that social dialogue and, and that conversation is the role of education and skills development. Again, is it the role of, of government to, to support um, uh, the development of, of courses for upskilling, redeployment and so on and so forth? Is it to do with further education, higher education? Where, where, where how do you start building um, the sk uh, and, and closing that skills gap for for the for for new and for a new way uh, of of living to a, a cleaner greener environment. Thanks, I think I think the you know the the important issue on this is, is Britain's immature approach to employer relations. Uh, I think that's quite a political point, but it's a political point that eighty percent of people in continental Europe don't see as being contentious is a tradition uh, almost traditional dislike of engaging um with representatives of the workforce and i think you know it, it, uh, you know we hear positive sounds from governments of all parties in the uk but the performance has been mixed and i think it's important that governments understand that what we are looking for is not the man on the horse white horse from whitehall to come and make life best for us because our experience is actually it tends to be here's a bit more money go away and, and to pick up Bill's point I've seen the impact of giving somebody on a pension of five thousand pounds in the late 80s thirty thousand pounds redundancy money um, and no no future that the money was spent very quickly um, and it did very little and I think what we need to do is to understand the role of government in helping other social partners to come up with a response. And I think it is the duty of government to do two things. There are two areas where government does act on behalf of society, and that's the important point. And one is education. And let's be clear, the challenge to the UK is that in the UK, the average British worker works 42 hours a week and produces as much as their German or French counterpart does in 30 hours. And this has been a problem and it's linked to skills. It's not, not, it's not to do with people being lazy, it's just due to skills. And what we need to do is to engage unions and employers more in the process of developing skills and, get, and giving parity of esteem 
to the technical skills. The great growth in university education in the UK, unfortunately, seems to have bypassed technical subjects to some extent. And I think we need to do that and we need to recognise that in the modern world, this is important. I think that's legitimate for government. But I, what I want government to do is to speak to unions and to employers about what they really want rather than going down this is the cheapest route and this is a problem i see in daily that graduates are not trained in the appropriate areas of science subjects so so we end up going through a process of retraining them at high expense to pick up ewan's point let's be blunt if as the taxpayer we are subsidizing the private sector to build wind farms then actually it's reasonable to say well, actually, we would like the money to be invested in the UK. That's perfectly reasonable. And before someone thinks this is terribly left wing, it's come out in recent days that a lot of US aid requires people to spend the money in the States, which probably, you know, is not unreasonable aim of economic policy. And I think also I'm very clear and, and I've had the argument and it's polite sometimes and sometimes not that in energy regulation, Actually, if you want to run a net regulated energy business in the UK, which is a monopoly and you want public money, then actually you need to invest in your stuff. You need to invest in basic skills and you need to invest in the supply chain. I think one of the things I've seen over the years and it was it was the same in energy as it was in steel as in coal was the small and medium enterprises do look to the large players to do the training. I think there's a massive opportunity here for government to work in partnership with unions and business actually to deliver what voters want, which is a more efficient economy. I don't think, you know, I, I noticed Ewan's comments about coal mines. Nobody wants a difficult, arduous, low paid job. What we want is people to live to their, their potential. And I think the the challenge of industrial change is not the panic of how do we avoid catastrophe It's actually how can we build back something better and I'm tired of hearing politicians say it and not doing it we need to engage people who understand what happens and come up with a day forward I know I don't understand like a technocrat saying please come and speak to me but actually my view is that businesses and unions know a lot more about how to develop and revitalize what they're doing then somebody sat then, then then government and I think we need that partnership where everyone plays their part to deliver a better and more sustainable future. Thank you Mike for that and I think it's very clear uh, the, the task and the ask before us and, and I think if I you and if I could just quickly rope you in with what what Mike was saying what what in your mind needs to change? Um, how does how does the edu education sector need to change to respond to that that skills gap? Ewan, could you give us some thoughts? What what what's missing across the education landscape just now, as as you see it? I mean, I, I think one of the things is is cultural, and I think that is about parity of esteem and respect for, um, you know, what we might call manual or technical skills of various sorts. Um, but I, I think there's also actually blaming this on the education sector isn't all, and I don't think Mike was saying that, but it's not necessarily that helpful because there's also a context of the labour market and perceived demands in the labour demand in the labour market and demand from employers. And I think that's part of the problem here as well, that in the time period that I was talking about where some of these transitions were managed relatively successfully, coal mining, steel and, and power generation were publicly owned industries in the UK. And the those public corporations had an investment in a remit in regional economies and, and the national economy for that matter, and were expected and, and often did behave um, in ways which put long-term economic welfare ahead of short-term economic gain. Um, I don't want to start a debate over whether these sectors should or shouldn't aid public ownership. My view on that's pretty clear, but I think what's important um, is, is where these sorts of utilities and important areas of the economy have a remit and an expectation on them to behave socially responsibly 
and 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 to act in dialogue with trade unions, community organisations, and government. That does change their actions. And I think Bill's um, example from Germany is an important example that it isn't necessarily the case that these organisations, these industries, have to be publicly owned, but I think they have to be regulated and integrated into societal objectives and government objectives and that has to be the case with the debate over a just transition because we're not saying we need to do this purely for market outcomes or economic benefits we're saying we need to do it for the needs of the planet and for the needs of our national society more specifically within that as well and that has to involve those sorts of structures and dialogue I think it has to involve different sets of incentives and, and that that does include education policy. I think it's where it's integrating education policy with, particularly with large employers and placing expectations and requirements on large employers who, as Mike rightly says, are often, particularly in the sectors we're talking about, in receipt of considerable uh, public welfare in effect. Um, so, we expect citizens to behave in certain ways when they're in receipt of public welfare. I don't see why that shouldn't be the case of large companies either. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Ewan. And 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 I guess it's that I'm um, just just conscious of the time there. Um, but it's that the very last point is around the needs of the planet, and I guess that is a challenge that's right before us because although you know th this is about the needs for the planet, it's for um, ultimately it's for protecting our environment for our generations and our future generations to come. And I guess it's a sense of maybe it's not. Uh, a priority for those who are living, you know, day to day, um, securing an income uh, and feeding the families and so on and so forth. So not everyone will, who's involved in this conversation will necessarily be looking at the long termism, but it's more about short and me medium termism. And I'm just wondering, um, Bill, in terms of, you know, the last words, how do we balance this conundrum needs of the planet short-term, medium-term, long-term uh, benefits of, of a fair and, and just transition? And and, and are, are we able to do it? <laughs> the million-dollar question, does it? I think, <laughs> um, you know, I, I think there is a much improved awareness amongst local populations around the need to do things differently. I think uh, people are coming to a conclusion that, you know, certain behaviours may have to change and for us all to be secure we need to have a, a, a plan towards 2050 or earlier um, and part of that plan I think can start in the workplace and one of the things that we're concentrating on is is um, we, we, we do have around about five different ways now that workers can actually uh, look at this you know from a 15 minute kind of online statement and video right through to a kind of five day training program for people who will be involved in negotiations. And I think the more we do that across industry, not just in, you know, the, the, the plants and the uh, other workplaces that are directly at risk, I think the more we can uh, get people to become involved and make the necessary changes, whether that's switching to public transport away from, you know, big diesel four-wheel drives or whether it's about in, you know spending money on insulating your home or changing from gas to some other fuel there's lots of things that people can do and I think one of the things that I've been uh, faced with is people say you know it's such a big issue you know if the Chinese and the the Indians aren't doing it then what's the point well I've been brought up in a trade union environment that says building of little things you can achieve big things it's like when you when you think about health and safety, one little change in a procedure could save many lives in a particular industrial uh, capacity. So the more people understand about what's necessary to do, the more cooperation and dialogue we have about planning for those dates in the future, the more that we've got a chance of, of, of changing our economy into net zero without having the casualties that we've seen you know uh, since 1980s and I think one of the thing is we need to get very serious about social dialogue and responsibility 
of government and employee, employers to speak to unions and to speak to employees and make sure that there is a long term plan so that all that kind of insecurity can be abated and people can look forward to, uh, you know, a life after 2050. Hopefully a good one. My, my my thanks, Bill, and and that's really truly reflective of what this um, this conversation today is is all about. And so, with that, I, I would like to thank um, uh, Bill, uh, Mike, and Ewan for your your wonderful contributions. You've certainly given us uh, and everyone who's listening in to this very challenging very serious conversation much uh, to think about um we will reflect on all the points that that, that you said and we will we will we will use that to produce a, a, a briefing note that we will share with, with everyone. Um, but this is just the start of the day's co conversation. Um, and after our, our break, we have for half an hour, we'll be hearing from experts who will talk us through um, what those national drivers of change uh, look like. But for now, I just want to thank again uh, all our contributors and uh, look forward to seeing you after the short coffee break. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, um, a good morning back. I uh, hope you enjoyed your half an hour stretch your legs and had a cup of coffee and back to our um, conference today, Just Transition and Structural Change in Coal Regions. I just want to say um, uh, and suggest um, in order to mobilise the chat and the conversation a little bit more, um, and I'm wondering whether the easiest way to have conversation is if you would like to ask any questions uh, to our, uh, our experts who are joining us this morning. If you could raise your hand um, and just uh, um, come back on, on video um, and ask your questions directly, if that feels more comfortable than uh, typing it in the chat box, I'm happy to accommodate either, um, either uh, approaches uh, to that. Um, so we would really love to uh, foster and engage a uh, conversation with, with our um, experts. So please feel comfortable to do that and uh, we would really welcome welcome that. So what I would like to do is just scoop up from the session that we had this morning. Today we, um, we are hearing that the coal mining industry now in the UK employs less than 700 uh, people. But to get to that uh, point, the the mining uh, landscape has changed considerably uh, in, in the UK. And we have gone through uh, what we were hearing through a, a sense of struggle that goes back uh, these decades. Um, and uh, thinking through how we've gone through that struggle and whether we have made a full recovery from the collapse of, of our coal mining industry and to some extent we have and there have been still kind of like long term uh, uh, consequences. Um, the need for a managed and, and sustainable and a fair and just transition came very through very clearly uh, from the conversation we were having this morning. So this um, session, um, the second session uh, this morning is about looking at transitioning from coal, the national drivers of, of change. And what we're going to do, we're going to hear from and, and to discuss lessons that have been learned for national policies aimed at ensuring a, a just transition. Um, and, and we do have uh, different frameworks and approaches that we have in the UK, such as our, our Just Transition uh, Commission here in Scotland, um, and also through different frameworks that are, that are um, being developed uh, in, in England as well. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Steve Fothergill, who is um, uh, at the Centre for Regional uh, Economic Social Research um, at Sheffield Hallam University to give us his insights into how our national frameworks in the UK have changed, are changing, and um, some thoughts and ideas as to how national frameworks can be can be developed and thought through um, in, in other parts um, of Europe. So uh, without further ado, um, I'd like to invite uh, Steve um, to give his thoughts this morning. Thank you, Steve, and over to you. Thank you, and um, good morning, colleagues. Um, I'm going to attempt to uh, share my screen. So just bear with me one second. 
let's just start off by um, explaining a little bit about who I am and where I fit into um, all of this um, issue and discussion. Um, yes, I, I'm, I'm an academic. I'm a, a long-term academic indeed. Um, um, my expertise is in urban and regional economic development. Um, my background is, uh, is economics. Um, and these days, yes, I'm a professor at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, but when we're talking about what's happened in the UK context um, to the coal fields and to the coal industry, um, I've also um, got and had um, a major second role because I've for many years worked outside academia as well. Um, back in uh, the late 1980s, in 1988 indeed, um, I was asked to become the national director of what was known at that time as the Coalfield Communities Campaign, um, which um, was the association of local authorities in the former mining areas of England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and the, the job of the Coalfield Communities Campaign was particularly to um, try to lobby for policies and, uh, and funding to regenerate former mining areas. Um, I held that role for two decades and I remain the national director of its uh, of the successor body to the Coalfield Communities Campaign, something called the Industrial Communities Alliance, which brings together um, the local authorities in all of Britain's older industrial areas. Um, well, actually, not quite all. If we had a clean sweep, we'd have rather more member authorities than we've got. Uh, but around about 50 or 60 uh, local authorities across England, Scotland and Wales in the coal, steel, shipbuilding, textile areas um, of, of the country. Um, so I look at what's been happening in the coal industry um, and in the coal fields, um, both as a researcher and as one of the policy players in this game, because there are very few substantial initiatives to try to regenerate uh, former mining areas um, that I haven't had a significant hand in over the last three or indeed four decades. Um, so, my overall perspective on um, what's happened in the UK, and you might have heard this already in the previous session, which unfortunately I wasn't involved in. Um, the UK has virtually completed its move away from the production and use of coal. But, and these are very big buts. Essentially, this was not planned, except perhaps in the last few years, the last half a dozen years or so. It was not something that was deliberately planned. Um, nor was it driven primarily by concerns over climate change. Uh, climate change concerns perhaps only um, uh, come into the picture in the last four or five years in a big way. And the UK's move away from coal um, has not been painless. So I'm not necessarily saying that you've got to follow the uh, the UK experience, um, the UK model in some sort of rigid way. Uh, I think that would be a mistake uh, to do that. Now, just again to put things into perspective, it, it's um, it's worth showing these really quite astonishing figures um, because they illustrate just how much the United Kingdom was at one point in time dependent on uh, UK coal uh, production. Uh, we produced, uh, pro production peaked just ahead of the First World War, more than a century ago. At that time, we were producing over 290 million tonnes of coal a year, 1.1 million miners, these are staggering numbers, 3,000 coal mines uh, across the country. Um, it is fair to say that um, the Industrial Revolution in the United Kingdom was ultimately uh, built on, on coal production um, and uh, use. Um, more re over the more recent period, we've seen this, uh, this steep decline uh, in uh, coal employment and uh, in production. Uh, there are figures here for the, the output from deep mines. Most of our coal was hard coal and came from deep mines. Um, 
we were still producing large quantities in the 70s and the 80s, but um, the quantities of coal produced fell away uh, sharply um, thereafter. And indeed, the last uh, deep coal mine in the UK uh, closed in uh, December of 2015. Uh, we have mined some coal in, in the UK uh, through open cast methods, but that's also uh, fallen away um, in recent times. And as you can see, um, you know, the employment has fallen from that figure of well over a million 100 years ago, 600,000 in the 1960s, uh, still something around a quarter of a million mark in the night at the beginning of the 1980s. It's now a uh, negligible um, employer. So we don't produce coal anymore to any significant extent, and the industry uh, doesn't employ um, uh, people to any significant extent anymore. Uh, do we actually still use coal, however? Well, not very much. Um, the, the power stations have for many years been the, uh, the dominant source of, of coal use um, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, uh, the amount of coal use um, has fallen away uh, to next to nothing. We still have, I think, three large coal-fired power stations in operation uh, here in the UK. Um, but they're essentially just brought on at peak times to help meet, meet uh, peak demand. Um, the other coal use, um, that's primarily uh, in steel production. You need to feed in coal um, in order to produce uh, iron uh, from blast furnaces. Um, most, if not most, the vast majority of the coal that's now used in the UK, which isn't very much, um, is actually imported coal. Um, I'm not quite sure of the precise sources at the present point in time. I think quite a lot comes from Russia. Um, but um, the important thing there is, is um, that uh, coal consumption as well as coal production uh, has virtually disappeared. Um, you will see in these figures that the uh, uh, that there's been really quite a turnaround um, uh, over the uh, over the last decade. Um, even in 2010, we were still using um, uh, 40 million tons a year of coal in power stations. Uh, the big changes happened uh, around about the the middle of the uh, of the decade. I'll uh, just show you some figures on um, uh, electricity production. Um, sources of, um, uh, of of electricity supply. Um, you know, coal was still um, a significant player, um, really until the beginning of the middle of the last uh, last decade. You know, accounting for you know, a little bit less than a third of UK electricity supply. Um, two things have happened that um, have more or less eliminated coal from the picture. One is the rise of renewable uh, energy, particularly. Uh, wind and, and, and solar power. Uh, the other one was that um, in, in, during the, uh, the last decade, uh, the UK government introduced a tax on carbon. And as it ramped up the, uh, the value of that tax on carbon, it, um, it flipped the relative economics of coal-fired electricity generation versus gas-fired electricity generation. And it wasn't that more gas stations were built, it was that it became more economic to run the gas-fired stations uh, rather than the coal-fired stations. So you can see um, uh, in that change between 2015 and 18 that you know the the share of electricity supply from gas increased, uh, whereas um, uh, for coal um, it fell away uh, sharply. Uh, there are plans um, to completely eliminate um, coal-fired electricity generation. Um, by 2024 or 2025. Um, that is probably achievable, uh, but the uncertainty um, in the current uh, energy market perhaps just raises a little bit of a question mark about whether that final uh, elimination of coal uh, will indeed uh, prove possible. So, um, let's, uh, let's just look at the consequences of this. Um, really quite enormous and long-term uh, decline of what was a major industry in the United Kingdom, possibly the, the biggest and most significant industry in the whole of the UK economy, uh, indeed, at one point in time. Um, well, for the coal companies themselves, 
Um, what you do need to be aware of is that the UK coal industry was fully privatised um, in 1995. Prior to that, for 40 years, it had been state-owned. Um, but it has meant that anything that's happened from 1995 onwards um, has been a purely commercial decision. It's not been governments deciding to um, close mines. It's the, the mine operators are simply concluding um, that it was no longer commercially viable to um, uh, keep on uh, trying to produce coal. Um, some of the coal producers went out of business, but the, um, the very largest um, of the private um, coal companies is still there in the different form and has essentially become a property developer. Um, it's uh, been using its really quite extensive land assets, old um, colliery sites and open cast sites to build houses and industrial estates and, and so on and so forth. Uh, the consequences of all of this for electricity consumers, um, again, bear in mind that uh, the UK electricity industry uh, like the coal industry, was fully privatised, um, in this case from uh, the 1980s onwards. Um, it's the carbon tax um, that is essentially uh, killed off coal most recently, but this has had the effect of increasing electricity prices uh, for consumers. And that's also been the case uh, with the substantial subsidies to, uh, to renewable energy supplies. Um, uh, that's a considerable problem for a number of energy intensive industries, and it's an ongoing problem indeed uh, for industries such as the steel industry, which here in the UK um, uh, buy electricity supplies at um, inflated prices substantially higher uh, than those available to, um, to competitors um, in mainland Europe. And that's a real problem, and that's one that's not been uh, solved. Um, but the real problems that I suppose most people you know, in this conference will be concerned about are the consequences for miners and um, mining communities. And I think there are two big questions here that um, we need to look at uh, carefully. Uh, one is what happened to the redundant miners? And the second question is, have the jobs in the coal industry uh, been replaced? Let me now step back a moment and put those issues into some sort of context. Um, first point is that the problems arising from colliery closures in the UK are nothing new. Um, we were losing the jobs from the coal industry in the 1920s and 30s. There were major job losses in the 1960s. These problems extend a long, long way back time. Uh, the second issue that you need to bear in mind is that the UK is a relatively densely populated country um, and these days also a country with relatively car high ownership. Um, if you live in a former mining area you're not necessarily out you know in most cases you're not in somewhere highly remote that's a long long way from other centres of population and of, of employment. And also despite the scale of the coal industry it's worth bearing in mind that it was never actually the sole employer in the UK coal fields, even if it was often uh, the largest. Um, the UK coal fields um, spread around the country. Um, those are dark areas on that map um, uh, are the main areas where coal mining uh, was still in operation uh, at the beginning of the, of the 1980s. Uh, those areas um, have a population, a combined population in total, of around about five and a half million people. Uh, that's a little bit less than 10% of the entire uh, UK population, which is illustrating the fact we're talking about you know, a substantial uh, chunk of the, uh, of, of the UK here. So how were um, redundancies managed? Well, in the first instance, there was very extensive use of what I suppose is often termed voluntary redundancy and also uh, of transfers uh, from mines that were closing uh, to surviving pits, at least for a while. Now, that was possible because uh, 
Um, in the first stages of the rundown, the coal industry was still a, a large state-owned corporation, and uh, therefore it was easier to move people uh, from mine to mine. And indeed, uh, in England, uh, there was a single dominant uh, uh, privatised uh, producer that was again able to move people from mine to mine. Now, that combination of voluntary redundancies and transfers to surviving mines meant that what actually happened um, is that the people who were willing to leave the industry on the whole uh, took redundancy. In some instances, they had something of a financial gun put to their head uh, to encourage them to, uh, to leave the industry. Uh, but those who were determined to stay in the industry were, in the first instance at least, able to transfer to the uh, surviving coal mines. Now, the job loss um, that did occur was softened by uh, relatively generous redundancy payments, um, typically worth, say, a full year's wages. And for some of the, uh, the redundant workers, um, they were able to gain early access to, to occupational pension schemes and also to welfare benefits. In practice, uh, what happened is the older men tended to leave and the younger um, hung on at least for a while. And there was cert there's certainly a generation of miners who in this process of uh, rundown and contraction of the industry moved from coal mine to coal mine, mine to coal mine. And by the time they were finally made redundant, when the very last mines were closed, um, sometimes these men had a history of working in you know, five or six different mines, uh, and sometimes commuting quite substantial distances um, to work in those mines um, as well. There was um, some help with, with retraining. Um, uh, there, there was a financial package available to, um, to place people, to place men on, and it was mainly men, of course, um, to place uh, men on uh, schemes to, to retrain as lorry drivers and bricklayers and um, what plumbers or whatever else it might be, or to um, adapt their skills as electricians to work um, in other contexts other than the, the coal mines. Um, so there was some help with retraining. And um, there was also employment advice available to, um, uh, to redundant uh, miners. But it really should be said that often the management of this process was pretty brutal. You know, at times uh, it was announced that um, a colliery was going to close and the, the men had no more than just three or four days notice that that was going to happen. Um, um, we had a very, very serious uh, major industrial dispute in here in uh, in Britain uh, in 1984-85, um, um, which was the longest and largest um, uh, industrial dispute, certainly since the Second World War um, in Britain. Um, some 200,000 miners were um, on strike at the time. Um, that resulted in, um, in, in defeat for the mining union. They were on strike to try and prevent colliery closures. It gave management the upper hand and management brutally exploited um, at that uh, upper hand. So what about these redundant miners? What, what's happened to them? Well, well frankly, nearly all the um, redundant miners have now reached state pension age. Um, if you were working in the industry in the um, 70s and 80s and 90s, you probably are now. Um, uh, state pension age. It's gone up from 65 to 66 since I put these slides together a couple of years ago. Um, and the dominant concern is, is less now about the redundant miners themselves, and more about the jobs for the generation uh, behind them, uh, for the youngsters who once upon a time might have gone down the mines uh, to earn a living. Uh, which brings us to the, uh, the whole issue of coal field regeneration. Um, the efforts to promote new jobs in the in the UK coal fields uh, go back a long way. Um, the UK invented regional economic policy, and it did so as much as anything to um, to help rebuild the economy of the coal fields. And these efforts 
um, you know, first started in the 1930s. Um, and certainly they were very uh, vigorous in the immediate post-war years in the 1960s and, and so on. But there's been nothing automatic in the support for, um, uh, for regeneration. Um, it's something that's been hard fought for um, and, and uh, the subject of um, very much a political battle. Uh, the Coalfield Communities Campaign, which I mentioned, um, which from 1988 onwards I was the chief officer of, not the political boss, um, you know, was pretty central in all of this. Um, and one of the big steps forward was something called the Coldfields Task Force, um, which was established um, in the late 1990s by the then Labour government uh, to review um, what could be done to help regenerate the former coalfields and, and a whole raft of actions uh, followed from that uh, coalfields uh, task force. The key building blocks to um, economic regeneration in the former mining area as well. Colliery site reclamation has been has been one of the um, one of the tools that's been used uh, in England. Um, there was a program that addressed 107 former uh, colliery sites. This is a public publicly funded program. It uh, stems in part from that coalfields task force. Um, it um, has largely brought um, all of those sites either uh, back into productive use um, for housing or for industry um, or where that has not been possible um, uh, for public open space. Um, there are now, if I'm correct, around about 40,000 uh, jobs on those uh, former colliery sites. I think about 12,000 new homes and 2 million uh, square feet, I think square feet around metres, um, of new industrial and commercial floor space. Um, but that involved the input of uh, several hundred million of public uh, funds uh, to bring the, uh, the sites back into um, the use. Uh, we've also, uh, at least until the UK left the European Union, had a big input of EU structural funds to assist in regeneration of former mining. Um, and uh, we also had under the EU state aid rules something called assisted area status. Actually, assisted area status predates even Britain joining the EU, but um, uh, it, it carried on um, uh, under uh, EU rules. Uh, these were rules allowing um, financial assistance to companies to promote um, investments um, in less prosperous parts of the country. There's been substantial um, infrastructure investment, um, particularly in roads, I've got to say, because um, the road infrastructure of many former mining areas was not well suited um, to, to modern industry or indeed to commuting uh, to the cities. Um, and there's also been uh, invest in investment in social uh, renewal. We had something, we still have something called the Coalfields Regeneration Trust. Um, funded um, to a substantial extent by government, um, which has uh, spent money um, on trying to uh, keep alive and renew much of the social fabric of five former mining communities. Has all of this worked? Well, yes and no. If you, if you crawl over the numbers, and I'm one of those sad people who does crawl over numbers, um, it is now true that the total number of jobs lost from the UK coal industry since the 1980, early 1980s has been replaced by a similar number of new jobs for men in the same areas. Um, now, that's quite an achievement, and it does illustrate that regeneration of mining areas is possible. But, and these again are very big buts, it's taken a long time to achieve this, 20 or 30 years since the really big rounds of pit closures happened. Many of the new jobs are poorly paid. Uh, some places haven't made good the job losses at all. It's been a bit of a variable pattern across the country. Um, uh, the South Wales Valleys, for example, are, are di remain distinctly problematic. Um, uh, and the coal fields started off with high unemployment even before the pit closures started. And to complicate matters, you've not only had to replace the jobs uh, being lost 
uh, from the coal industry, but labour supply has been increasing too uh, in these areas through uh, rising economic activity rates and population growth. So in fact, in practice, there's still quite a big job shortfall in most uh, UK coal fields, despite uh, that substantial forward progress. I'll just, um, I'll just show you um, this little graph, which is about um, numbers on working age um, benefits um, uh, across the UK, because the, the, as I'll explain, this is pretty central to what actually happened in, 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 in mining areas. Now that um, light blue line that goes up and then down, then up and down, is, is the numbers on unemployment benefits. And um, you can see that um, uh, you know, by the time you get to um, uh, the more recent times, uh, the numbers out of work on unemployment benefits are, are really quite uh, quite modest, uh, about a million. Uh, all right, it's still large numbers, uh, but it's way below the three million uh, peak that we had uh, in the uh, in the 1980s and the early 1990s. Um, on the other hand, you'll see there is a line, a, a darker blue line, um, that rises steadily from about a level of 750,000 up to around about two and a half million uh, in the early 2000s, and then only tails away very slowly indeed. And that's the number of adults of working age um, out of the labour market on sickness and disability benefits. Um, uh, that is, is, has increasingly been uh, where out of work people in the UK have been parked. They've not been parked on unemployment benefits. And it's fair to say that the former mining areas have actually been the epicenter of that phenomenon. Um, uh, when the pits closed, people were really quite gobsmacked that um, uh, recorded unemployment didn't shoot through the roof. No, recorded unemployment didn't shoot the through the roof uh, because large numbers of men in particular, but also at later stages in the local labour market, women as well, dropped out of the, uh, the labour market um, onto sickness and disability benefits. Um, it remains the case that in uh, the, the coal fields, economic activity, inactivity, that's about being neither in nor in work nor uh, being recorded as unemployed. Economic inactivity amongst working age men is still 150,000 higher uh, than at the start of the 1980s. And I would argue that a lot of that is hidden unemployment. It also remains the case um, that the job density, um, the ratio between how many people live in an area and how many jobs there are in the area in every UK coal field is below the UK average. Uh, the employment rate, that's the share of adults actually in work, adults of working age in work, uh, is typically five to 10 percentage points below the level in the southeast of England. That southeast is our most prosperous region. And earnings in the former coal fields are uh, seven to eight percent on average uh, lower uh, than the national average, and twenty to twenty-five percent below uh, the level in London and the southeast of England. Uh, it's also the case uh, that the stock of businesses and the business formation rate in the former coal fields are well below uh, the UK average. So there has been forward progress. Yes, but substantial problems still remain even after all these years. Finally, then, um, what are the lessons from the UK experience? This is my last slide. Um, well, it is possible for a large, mature economy like the UK to move away from coal. It's happened. It's almost complete. Um, it's also the case that electricity markets can be structured to deliver that shift away from coal. Um, it's happened in the UK. We barely use coal um, anymore. Um, it's also the case that redundancies can be managed to ease the pain. And I'm thinking here of the use of voluntary redundancy and transfers from closing mines to uh, surviving mines. It is possible to ease the pain, even if that hasn't always happened um, here in Britain. 
Um, but there's no question at all um, that um, the rebuilding the economy of the coal fields is possible. It does take a long time. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Steve. Um, you, you've presented um, an interesting, uh, positive, but also at the same time a, a sobering picture as well. And you've given us lots and lots to to think about. Certainly from uh, the development of uh, regional um, economic policy and helping us to perhaps think about, you know, where where do we even begin with that? But what I'm hearing very clearly is this issue of time, um, mm. and time is of the essence. And with with our, our climate the way it is, so what what I'd like to do is come back to these questions um, and hopefully um, have that conversation together with others in the chat box. But just for now, Steve, I'd like to just thank you for for your presentation. Yeah. Um, and now I'd like to invite Steve Strangleman from uh, who's the director of the Work, Employment and Economic Life Research Cluster at the University of Kent uh, to provide his um, perspectives um, on our just transition from coal national drivers of change so um tim over to you thank you thank you it's uh, tim strangleman by the way not steve <laughs> sorry tim strangleman uh, sorry um okay can everyone see that yes yes we can brilliant um hopefully i'll just um, okay, uh, so how do I do this? So, um, um, could you just it, put it into slides? Um, could you put it into slideshow, um, yeah. Tim, at all? That would be really to. great. Is it working? There we go. Perfect. Thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, um, uh, I know Steve's work reasonably well, so I thought I'd do something completely different. There are no numbers in this presentation, um, you may or may not be glad to hear. Um, I thought I'd um, talk some, uh, s somewhat broad, more broadly about deindustrialization, um, more generally kind of uh, uh, keeping coal in the background. Um, I've done research on coal, but I've also result, researched multiple industries um, through the transition of deindustrialization. So I just wanted to talk about that because I think um, coal is one of the best examples of um, transition and how you might study it and how you might see mistakes from it. I was tempted to put one slide up and just say, um, don't do what we've done. And, and Steve's kind of put, uh, I think actually uh, it's a far more positive than I would um, probably I'm going to present here. Um, so deindustrialization more broadly, it's um, something that has um, impacted uh, North America, um, uh, the UK, Europe, Eastern Europe, um, and interestingly parts of Africa and India, some co subcontinent, as well as Australasia. Australasia. Um, so it's it's deindustrialization is defined really as the sustained and stripping out of industrial capacity. Obviously, in coal we're talking. Extractive industry. Um, the term deindustrialization and to deindustrialize is um, a product of um, uh, American and UK plans to um, deliberately deindustrialize and neuter Germany. Um, this was planned during the Second World War um, as a post war way of um, effectively controlling Germany, and that um, uh, was changed in the wake of, you know, with the rise of the Cold War. So that's where the term comes from. Um, it itself has a long history, um, and it, but it's usually marked from the 1970s onwards. But as Steve hinted at, the industrialization in this country um, goes back actually to the 90, to, certainly to the interwar period, um, and the industrialization has been noted for centuries in, in various places. Um, some people have actually talked about my home city of Canterbury has been deindustrialized de when the Romans left in the uh, fourth century AD. Um, what I wanted to show was 
the breadth of knowledge and experience, um, and this is a plug for Ewan's book, Cold Country, which is excellent. Um, there's a huge amount of knowledge that's been built up across the period of coalfield closure, um, reaching back, I guess, uh, into the 1960s, but particularly from the 1980s onwards. So what I would stress is that the UK is probably one of the best places to draw of what happened to one particular industry. Um, and what was what I'm interested in is how people in the 1980s who were researching mining industry, mining communities and mining closure were talking about the longer term prospects of those places and what was and what wasn't being put in place in terms of policy action. And this is just a selection of some of the books, but more recent, I've deliberately tried to get some of the more come out. Um, and what's interesting about the process of deindustrialization in this country in coal fields, as for the purposes of this presentation, is that we can now look back on what was being said about mining closure and mining rundown in the 1980s. And some of the more um, developed um, research that was being uh, done in the 1980s was projecting forward to show what would happen to places unless there were major policy interventions. And I know Steve's. Um, I wanted to put this into a broader context of an international literature on deindustrialization. And um, again, what I would stress is if uh, your countries have actually gone through processes of deindustrialization, and there is a literature on Eastern Europe uh, deindustrialization. But what I really wanted to stress here is that there is lots of knowledge in the academy and in, and actually in popular culture, Janesville is a very good example of what happens to cities when closure uh, happens, what happens to the pieces, people, what happens to the places, what happens to the community. And in particular, and this is uh, the field of deindustrialization studies, is very good on legacy. And um, the phrase, I'll, I'll develop this in a second, but on the top um, left hand there, um, the half life of deindustrialization. Um, is a really interesting way of thinking about industrial change and the legacy of industries, particularly extractive industries like the coal mining, which leads to legacy. Uh, so that's really um, to um, to give you a sense of of the knowledge base that is out there about what happens when the jobs go. So in a broader um, sense of uh, UK response to deindustrialization. Um, I think the Conservative government in the 19, uh, well, the back end of the 1970s and then in the 1980s, actively sought to move from the old economy. Um, this was for multiple reasons and complex reasons and sometimes very simplistic reasons. Oftentimes, many of the people involved in Conservative government didn't understand industry and industrial localities, um, in part because often um, there were no votes for Conservatives in uh, the Conservative Party in the former industrial uh, areas of Britain. By implication, they were represented by Labour uh, members and um, Labour local authorities. Also, going back to the 1980s, there was an absolute faith in market forces, market forces both for employment, but also to some extent social policy, so that there would be a recalibration of the market around good jobs um, in the new sectors that were going to be produced. So in essence, deindustrialization is about creative destruction. And it's interesting to see our current Prime Minister Boris Johnson still talking about market forces, um, but somewhat differently from um, the way Margaret Thatcher would have talked about them in the 1980s. So to some extent, UK deindustrialization was a deliberate economic and monetary policy aimed at transition from primary and secondary industries, extractive industries and secondary industries to the tertiary sector, to service and financial sector. 
So um, lessons from deindustrialization. Um, uh, the big thing that I, in, in contrast to Steve, what I, I, I was trying to bask off what Steve, I thought Steve would say, um, and I want to do something more broadly and, and perhaps uh, to think about deindustrialization in a kind of temporal context. So, and Steve hinted at this, uh, he talked about the long term um, processes at play. What really needs to be understood both in the coal field and elsewhere with deindustrialization is, is, it is that it is a process, not an event. Um, oftentimes, people, uh, politicians would see closure as the key point um, of uh, industrial transition. And what is really apparent from the literature across the board in terms of um, the experience of industrial closure is that however important the struggle for closure or against closure was, it's not simply about that. The, you need to understand the social, cultural, political, environmental, the health factors, as well as the economic factors involved. And taking the lead from um, Sherry Lincoln's work, um, Sherry's actually uh, a literary professor, but it's coined this really, really interesting idea that has really taken deindustrialization studies by storm um, because it's so uh, important in understanding um, industrial process or deindustrial processes. So she would say that deindustrialization has a half life. So it's not simply a question of turning an industry, whatever that may be, coal, steel, shipbuilding. Um, there's a legacy of it. Sometimes that legacy is important and, and, and uh, positive, but oftentimes that is a negative one. And that could be the environmental or it could be a kind of toxic cultural um, legacy. What's also, and Steve hinted at this, is that uh, that part of that half-life is a multi-intergenerational So it's not simply those directly impacted by closure, the people who may have um, retired in their 50s, 40s or even 30s. It's the sons and daughters of, and now increasingly it's the grandsons and granddaughters of those caught up in the process of change um, that we need to focus on. So if you think about, it could well be that um, the children leaving school uh, at the moment in the coalfield regions are probably even, could they possibly even be great grandsons and daughters of minors, um, of, of people maybe done it in the 1980s. But um, regardless, you've got um, a legacy, sometimes toxic, as I say, of an industry um, that might uh, post date closure by uh, three or four decades. So I'm just trying to. Right. Um, this is this is my attempt. <laughs> Don't be freaked out by this. Um, this was done for a slightly different purpose, but I, I'm I'm just trying to think. I don't usually use models like this, but I'm just trying to think through the temporality of what we've gone through. So don't worry too much about the labels. Just think um, of this as pre-industrial, industrial, and then de-industrial society. In in trying to put a bit of flesh on the bones of the idea of the half-life of the industrial deindustrialization, um, you might want to see it as the kind of area between an industrial and a de-industrial society. And one of the things I'm interested in is how an industrial society looks forward. What are its kind of mechanisms? How does it go from being embedded as a industrial society, culturally, socially, economically, to being dis disembedded through deindustrialization and industrial change? What then is it embedded in uh, in the future? And part you all have to think about through this transition for coal in your countries is I think what what you conceive of as the future. Um, uh, one of the big things, big learnings from uh, deindustrialization studies is oftentimes deindustrialized places and communities are marked by 
a lack of futurity, um, if I can use that phrase. So it's a lack of uh, a sense of there's something positive available in the future. Particularly in the United States, a lot of research has been done about the opioid crisis, um, and that is in in part driven, so scholars believe, um, through a sense of hopelessness, a kind of, to use a sociological term, anomie, that people can't see hope in the future. They can't envisage a future that might be better than the past they knew. Um, so this this model really is to try and think about what next, where are we going um, with, with the industrialization. So, um, so to wrap up the last couple of slides, lessons from the industrialization in the UK coal fields. I mean, Steve's far more um, able to do this to me. This is actually a picture of the Durham coal field coast, which I researched um, in the 1990s and early 2000s and there has been a, an awful lot of um, uh, cleanup here so this is I think now a, a country park or a certain certainly a, a walkway so the the 1980s would have been completely coal um, uh, dumping um, so the lessons really are long-term complex problems need to be addressed um, too often I think those issues were known about but uh, were not addressed by central government or when they were, they were addressed too late. I think the Labour government in the late 1990s did try, but oftentimes that was maybe a decade too late or half a decade too late. Um, closure, as I've said, is not. But is a process. Um, and then even when you're trying to remediate um, industrial closure, that structural investment in um, housing, in roads in factories the the type of thing that steve was talking about um, is not sufficient it also has to be in social and cultural um, uh, social and cultural investment particularly in terms of education and this um, needs to be be locally and from the bottom up as well as nationally so it needs national resources but um, spent and delivered at a local level. Um, too often, um, uh, coalfield redevelopment seems to be putting up a business park without not ne necessarily um, thinking about the people left behind, the, the sons and daughters or grandsons and daughters of coal miners. Um, and it's important really to stress that there um, has to be that sense of hope for the everything positive um, has to be emergent from um, coal field communities. So the takeaways, um, and this could have been my one slide, um, don't copy what the UK has done or more positively learn the lessons from um, what has been done here and what hasn't been done here. Um, I would really stress draw on the experience and scholarship um, around deindustrialization and particularly here coal field um, scholarship. We know About this. I remember um, interviewing people in the northeast uh, of England and there was a sense that they had been over researched because they knew what the issues were and they knew what the potential solutions were and it was a question of enacting it. So don't ignore the scholarship and the experiences from deindustrialization and particularly UK coal deindustrialization. I think it's important to be aware or think through that idea of the half-life that this aim of regeneration or transit has to be seen as a long-term process. I mean, we're now um, four or five decades into um, the, the deindustrialization process in the developed economies, and we are still um, seeing the problems that were enacted in the 1980s, for example, bubbling up in contemporary society. Um, be attentive to the social cultural factors in deindustrialization. This isn't simply about jobs or infrastructure. It has to be the social um, and connected with that, that last point there, good transitions must be moral, socially just and rooted in community. One of the lessons um, I would say is that Germany got this better 
that even in Germany, you're seeing the rise of the far right, um, ADF, um, and here there's um, been some quite reactionary uh, uh, movements that have bubbled up over the last five or ten years, and in part um, being created by that lack of um, future futuristicity, um, a sense of uh, faith in the future that the, the future might look better. So um, quite nasty um, fascist um, uh, politics can emerge from places um, and you might be talking about three decades after closure because of this transition has not been handled as well as it could have been. OK, I'll leave it there. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tim. You've certainly given us um, lots and lots to think about. Um, and I think that that your 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 presentation describing it as a process rather than a one off event is 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 quite it's a powerful uh, message um and an an important one to you know for everyone to to really pay pay attention to because it's not something that's going to happen uh, overnight and it is a process and it is a a lengthy one but um referring to what Steve was talking about um earlier it's taken you know 20 to 30 years in the UK and do we have that length of time um, uh, in, in 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 reducing our our carbon footprint. But before we have a, a much more detailed discussion on on the points you made, I can see Claudia uh, Patricolo who's got her hand up, and I wonder, um, Claudia, if you could um, uh, under your uh, camera and ask a question of uh, of of Steve and Tim and and uh, Steve and Tim. I wonder if you could just under your cameras and come back on screen. That would be great. So should I should turn on my camera as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Why not? Okay, I cannot. Basically, <laughs> sorry. Okay, fire away. Fire your question. And okay. tell us where you're, tell us where you're Okay, from. I think now it's working. You should see me. Okay. Uh, so first, a uh, little disclaimer. I'm a journalist, so your answer will be featured in uh, one article. Um, so basically, thank you very much for, for your uh, presentations, but I couldn't help but notice that uh, you're talking about a transition that took like 100 years. Uh, basically for the UK and also as Jeffrey was saying replacing the jobs it took like 20 30 years and also Steve in your presentation you said that it's entirely possible for a mature economy like the UK to move away from coal but here in Central and Eastern Europe uh, we don't have this very mature economy like the UK for example and uh, we don't have 100 years we do have nine years maybe to reach the European Union targets and even less maybe if we think about the latest United Nations report for example and yet we have countries that don't have a date for phasing out coal. Uh, so my question to maybe both of you is uh, what kind of practices from the UK do you really see that can be replicated in a region that is completely different from an economical point of view, from a historical point of view, and that doesn't have the same time as the UK had before? Thank you, Claudia. I wonder, Steve, if I could invite you to, to have a first stab at that question. Yeah, I'll have a first stab at that now. Um, I'll address time scale and indeed scale of the problem, if I could. Um, I think one of the reasons why um, we've been dealing with such a long time scale in, in, in Britain is the, is the sheer scale of, of the problem that um, uh, you know, we have faced. Um, I'm not aware that, um, that with the possible exception of Poland, um, that the countries of Central and Eastern Europe have anything like the scale of, uh, of a coal industry um, that uh, we in the UK ha have had. Um, I think the numbers are, are, are much more modest. And Poland, Poland is the real exception to all of this. I think the, the, the British experience perhaps offers more pointers and lessons for, for Poland, where there's a very large coal industry still, as I understand. Um, but, but in you know, the Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Hungary, and so on, um, correct me if I'm wrong, we, we're, we're generally talking about an, an industry which has 
only a, a small number of thousands of employees. Um, and uh, the, the overall challenge is therefore, um, in absolute terms, um, uh, not as great. I mean, for the individ each individual, it's still a, a challenge, of course. Um, uh, but it, it ought to be uh, possible to address those smaller scale um, job losses more quickly and, and efficiently than when you've been dealing with hundreds of thousands of job losses, which is what has been uh, the case uh, in, in, in the UK. Um, so I, I, I don't take the view that you need 100 years because we in, in Britain have had, had 100 years. Um, no, 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 no. Um, you know, if you're on about, you know, some mines closing in Bulgaria, for example, and you know, I was talking the other week to, um, um, I think it was one of the ex-ministers from, uh, from the Bulgarian government who was, you know, picking my brains about what to do about the lignite mines um, um, uh, in, in, in his country. And, um, you know, the, 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 these are problems which you ought to be able to, to sort, um, you know, over a relatively short time period. You know, a decade should be enough, I would have thought. Um, and by sorting, I mean um, particularly, you know, uh, finding work for the, for the redundant miners and, you know, developing at least some new job opportunities in the broader locality. Um, that um, would be available for the for the generation behind uh, the, the redundant miners, because because I think that's always been our predominant preoccupation in Britain. It, you know, it's been what about the generations who would have gone and worked in the mines? Um, you know, you, you would be you're taking such a hole out of local economies that the that the you know the very reason for being of some communities was was disappearing. You know, uh, okay, the miners might become pensioners and they. Um, they'll pass out their years comfortably, but what about the youngsters? Was always the question that we face. So Thank you. Sm smaller, smaller problem. Short, um, uh, shorter time scale. Thank, uh, thank you, I Steve. Um, Tim, your your thoughts on on those points that were raised by Claudia? Yeah, I I would agree. It, 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 the big thing is that. We took a long time to do it in the same way that we industrialised over a century and a half um, and learn the lessons as many countries did about industrialisation from our deindustrialisation. So the important thing is, and it should not be a slogan, but the, trans the just transition and the moral transition could be to proper green jobs, oftentimes in the energy sector. So, for example, um, it's still in its infancy, but carbon capture, but but more developed is um, ground sourced heating um, using um, energy, uh, the latent energy in the earth from deep coal mines. That's that's an established technology. It's actually um, available in the UK and elsewhere in the world. Um, you'll need exactly the same kind of skills that um, coal miners, redundant coal miners had, or engineers and electricians from coal mines, you'll need that in those sorts of things. So you can have energy um, uh, creation from redundant uh, infrastructure, coal mining infrastructure, but also there are lots of other green jobs that could be there. So don't forget the residual in, oftentimes coal mining is seen as a low tech, dirty, um, unskilled industry. Many, many coal miners uh, are highly skilled in terms of the trades, in terms of in engineering and uh, electrical engineering, but they're also skilled in terms of using complex machinery, very, very complex machinery, uh, maintenance and all those sorts of things. Exactly the kind of things that with retraining you'll need in um, the green uh, energy uh, revolution. Um, so. One of the things is that you've you've got a very positive story to tell. I don't think I've ever met a miner that um, wanted to go back underground. They wanted to go back underground, or they wanted to, a job. One one of miners said to me, um, I, "I wouldn't. I, I I hated the job. I love the people." <coughs> so what people will miss is not the physicality of doing that particular job, but if you can positively pull out the kind of cultural and social from those industries. Um, I've no idea. I, I would imagine it's very similar 
in elsewhere from the UK. But people don't necessarily want to do those jobs. There's nothing inherently that they want to do about those jobs. But, it, but it's about that sense of hope and organised hope for the future, I think. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm like Steve, I think, I think it could be managed very, very quickly. Thank you, Tim, for that. And Claudia, I hope that, that answers your question. And just, yes, um, you. just you reflecting on what um, Steve and Tim were both saying, I guess, you know, the whole business of a, a just transition requires leadership from, um, uh, and the development of a very robust and very clear um, just transition framework. Um, uh, and and that, that really explains the just part of that transition, which is often missing um, in that whole package of just transition and unpacking what the just element means um, and how it can be, uh, how it can inform and shape that process of change. But also uh, more, more um, uh, significantly is how uh, we can measure the impact that um, that transition has made and, and tracing back to that. So I, I just want to thank you, Claudia, for, for your question. I've got another question here in the chat box just now. Um, uh, in Poland, uh, this is from Dr. Michael Mikowelowicz, um, in Poland, electricity prices are skyrocketing, uh, um, partly due to the tax paid on emissions as part of the ETS. This tends to reduce public support for phasing out of coal, which is seen as a cheap source of uh, electricity. Uh, can you think of ways in which governments can address these sharp price hikes to preserve public support for a just, sustainable and timely uh, tra transition? So the, the focus is on um, uh, ways in which governments can address the, that. that. I'm wondering, Steve, if I could ask you that question. Yeah, let, let me have a crack at that one. Um, uh, the the, uh, the carbon taxes. Um, uh, I know in Britain, um, the the level of carbon tax um, has. Um, not being it wasn't a requirement um, of the European Union. It was it was set at a uh, at a level um, uh, that suited the UK government. Um, uh, now in Poland, um, I'm sure that there will be EU level requirements. Um, but um, as long as you meet those minimum requirements, um, uh, do you really have to have such a high uh, level of carbon tax? Um, we used carbon tax, or the government in the UK used carbon tax as a mechanism for trying to um, eliminate some of the final use of coal. Um, uh, but you know, there are there are other mechanisms as well that could um, could surely be used. I mean, as long as you have the alternative, you know, generating capacity, um, you know, do you really have to use, rely on a price mechanism? To, um, to to actually deliver the changeover. I mean, without knowing the details of, of exactly what's happening in Poland at the present point in time, you know, I'm, I'm guessing at what, you know, might be the ways forward um, in, in all of this. Um, but, you know, whether or not coal is used is not simply about whether or not, um, uh, you know, it's taxed heavily. Um, yeah, taxing it heavily is a disincentive to its use, um, but reducing its use um, is also in practice about having other alternative forms of generating capacity in, in place. Thank you, Steve. Tim, I wonder if you could reflect on that um, that point as well. Yeah, and, and again, I think this gets to just transition and green jobs. So, for example, um, uh, if you say to people, do you want cheap energy? W uh, most people can say, yes, of course they are. Um, but, but there's a cost to coal. And what one of the win-wins with tr just transition is some of the high-tech jobs that coal mining uh, communities could transition to are very high-tech, uh, very good jobs in terms of installation of, for example, air source heat pumps. They're probably one of the best ways of retrofitting older housing, for example, micro-generation, um, 
producing the infrastructure for a green economy, electric cars, um, just just maintaining and introducing that sort of stuff. So I, I would say to people, so for, so, so for example, my house, uh, now we don't use any gas in it, and that's because I've got an air source heat pump. It was expensive, but it will pay off over a seven year period, but that's the role of government to make that so cheap and so attractive that it would be an absolute no brainer to go to that rather than use expensive um, other other forms of fuel. fuel. But it's not simply about getting cheap energy in the short, medium and long term. But it's also there will be a continual need to manufacture, to install and then to maintain those um, uh, new technologies. And and they are not low tech that that I, I've learned through um, through the experience of having this done to my house, um, solar panels and air source heat pump. Those are really, really serious. They're steps up from domestic um, heating engineers. They they are really, really quite complex uh, mixes, of which which again, you're retraining a workforce that's already minded to be mechanically and electrically savvy. So those are sort of the sorts of uh, jobs that it, it, it's a really positive story but it, it can't be done just by people deciding to change that technology it has to be heavily subsidized um, to push people into it but then also the infrastructure the, the training infrastructure to make sure that um, there are people on the ground in those communities made redundant from the mines that can go into those sorts. I mean, to retrain to be an engineer in green technology, you're talking about maybe two years um, and then some. So that's the kind of that's role for government, European Union uh, and local government that, that really needs to be done. I think it's a positive story. Um, yeah. Yeah. Could, could I just pick up on this issue of, of green jobs? Yeah, yes, you can. Um, because I, I just wanted to refer back to to the to the jobs aspect and what what um Tim was saying as well, and that reference to manufacturing the tech. Um, what we were hearing uh, in the session, um, uh, the first session this morning, that much of that manufacturing is being sourced uh, elsewhere, um, and it's doing a disservice to those um who have been displaced. Um, you know, from uh, that the, the industry um, and those jobs have not been replaced. And so there's a, a, a gap there in terms of upskilling and training and so on and so forth. So I wonder if at that point, Steve, you can come in and, and yeah, give yeah. us a reflection I, on that education I, I, aspect. I, well, I, the, the bit I'd particularly like to comment on, on is, is the role of, of green jobs in all of this, because um, I don't think we should be going away with the assumption that, um, you know, cost the jobs that are disappearing in energy, uh, are in energy, the, the way forward is to replace them with new jobs in in, in a different uh, energy sector. I mean, obviously that would be good um, if, if it uh, were to happen. Um, but the experience in, in the UK in recent times is that the biggest source of, of new employment in the former mining areas has been warehousing and distribution. Um, there are now almost two thirds as many jobs in warehousing and distribution in the former coal fields as there were jobs in the coal mines in the 1980s. I mean, such is the expansion uh, of this sector. And, and, and actually, you know, many of the new distribution uh, centers that have um, uh, been constructed in recent times uh, have actually been cited on former coal sites. You know that there were parts that were brought back into use through the through the site reclamation program. Um, uh, they're not ideal jobs by any means, um, but they're jobs in places you know where jobs were needed. Um, and it's not just actually in that uh, warehousing distribution either. I mean, one of the single biggest source of new jobs in the uh, in the former Durham coalfield example is, is car manufacturing. I mean, the Nissan. Car plants, which is by far and away in terms of output the biggest car plant in uh, in the United Kingdom, six thousand jobs directly on site, probably twice as many again in suppliers uh, throughout the locality. And if you throw your hands up in horror and thinking 
car manufacturing isn't green. Well, you know, Nissan are now moving on to to invest in a major battery manufacturing um, uh, uh, plant on site uh, to move their production in, in, into green production. So, so yeah, I mean, green jobs can be part of the picture, but there are other sorts of jobs as well. Uh, and in practice, I mean, we didn't see it coming when we, we were trying to promote regeneration in the 80s and 90s. We didn't see this wave of development in, in warehousing distribution as being, you know, the big new source of jobs. But that's actually what it has turned out to be. Thanks for that, um, Stephen. It gives you know a slightly different spin and a different perspective on it. And and I just I want to re relate back to this point about um, the development of regional um, economic policy. And and Tim, you described very nicely, you know, the, how much knowledge we have uh, in the UK um, and what we have learned. Um, we have uh, this great legacy in terms of you know what has worked, what has not worked. So in terms of the development of economic and regional economic policy for um, for, 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 for other countries, um, where does one start? Um, well, picking up on Steve's point, um, when I was uh, interviewing people, particularly in the East Midlands, because of the locality in the UK, the centrality of that, that was absolutely ideal for regional distribution, the national regional yeah. distribution. Yeah. And, and I remember talking to someone who said, he said, the economy is going like a train. We're filling up all these spaces of um, special development areas, um, tax breaks and all the rest of it. But he said, he said to me, they're the, I, don't, I think he said, they're the wrong type of jobs. In particular, he was worried about um, distribution companies and um, uh, food manufacturing. And he said that, uh, and, and there's an academic um, uh, who, who talked about, he, he used to commute from uh, Manchester to Essex uh, at the weekend. And, and he, he said, if he had the car window open, he would just smell the smell of bacon being made for bacon sandwiches. Because again, um, the East Midlands was this hive of um, sandwich manufacturing. And um, so I think you need some kind of planning. It's very difficult to turn down jobs. Um, and, and that was the problem. What, what happened in some of the coal field areas was that it, it, in the desperation, they locked into industries that were either low paid or not necessarily long term. So for example, this was also at the time of the boom in call centers. And, um, and all, and also at the time in the northeast, there were um, silicon um, chip manufacturers. Um, there were about three that opened up and then closed down within a five year period in the northeast. And the regional economic development people at the time said um, they they were sort of saying the industry lasted, the coal industry lasted 100 years. We're now thinking 10 years um, and then we'll be looking for something else and perhaps there's a kind of argument for being a bit more um, planned in in the rollout of that and i think that's where a transition that upskills people and I, and I take steve's point about um i was just using green jobs as an example and and also greenwashing um there are lots of really uh, unattractive jobs in the green economy in terms of recycling and all the rest of it but there are some really high tech jobs that would be um, um very attractive, I think, to former coal miners or coal mining communities. Um, uh, so, and, and it, it, because there's space involved, you know, there, there, there might be a, a lot of um, positivity for that. But I think uh, to go back to your question, I think it's not a question of what we would always. The criticism against planning is that you're picking winners, you're letting politicians pick winners, but there are lots of lessons to be learned by not rushing into a low wage economy. So, for example, again, um, one of the best examples of um, in the East Midlands is a coal mine um, uh, to the north of Nottinghamshire in Derbyshire that was uh, now is a distribution centre and um, it, it um, attracted in lots of um, East European labour. So many of the local people didn't get jobs in 
in that um, in that distribution center um, um, and, and that caused tensions and problems of its own and developed a very kind of unsustainable low wage um, poor set of jobs for the, the locality so, and 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 you're not necessarily getting the tax base there or the tax spend in the locality so it's it's a question of being a bit more planned and being a bit more long term about what happens i think in the uk in the 1980s 1990s especially early in the 1990s people were desperate to get jobs at any cost and that wasn't necessarily always the best tactic so planning i think is important. thank you um tim and steve i mean we, yeah. if we can share some thoughts with our um with our delegates um obviously you know different different countries different landscapes we've been through this process and we want to try and identify you know a pathway forward and in terms of that pathway what are the first steps that, that need to be uh, taken right can, can i can i say here that if you're looking for some sort of single silver bullet you know an action that you should take um, that will make everything, you know, okay. Um, it, it's totally the wrong path to, to, to go down. Um, successful economic regeneration uh, in any locality, whether it be a former coal field or you know, a steel area or um, some inner city um, area, you know, re generally requires action on a broad front. Um, you, 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 you've got to have sites and premises for, for, for businesses you know, somewhere for, for these things to go uh, you you need proper connectivity which um, you know it's not just road connectivity but it's also you know um, internet uh, these days needs to be of a very high standard but particularly it's an absolute essential to have a decent road network uh, in place you need financial incentives to make it worthwhile for businesses to go to those sorts of perhaps out of the way localities rather than uh, simply opt for the the obvious easy locations in more prosperous uh, parts of the country and you need to invest in in, in skills in in the local people i mean not 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 just training up people generically for all sorts of activities but also actually trying to tra train people in uh, of the sorts of activities that are coming into an area so that you know if it's a big car plant like the one in in the northeast of england you know there, there, are, there are mechanisms in place to train people up in the sorts of activities that the, the car plant uh, requires now you need to work on all of these fronts and more fronts as well and you also need to sequence the the um the activities correctly i mean it's no good you know making the financial incentives available for development in certain places if you haven't in the first instance got the basic infrastructure of, of sites and premises and road access uh, in place. I mean, we've made that mistake in the past. We thought, oh, well, let's draw a line around, uh, you know, somewhere on a map and make, you know, make grants available there to businesses. It won't happen unless you put in the basic facilities to enable businesses to grow there in the first place. Um, so road front action um, and in a coordinated, planned, even sequenced way, um, is, is the way forward. Um, and there are successful examples of that um, in, in the UK, I've got to say. Um, I mean, the one I always think of is, is an area called the Dern Valley in, in South Yorkshire, in the heart of the former uh, Yorkshire coalfield, where, um, you know, where the coal industry was probably more dominant at one point in time than, than anywhere in, in, uh, in Britain. Um, and, you know, the, the site reclamation happened a new link onto the motorway uh, was developed. Um, it gained enterprise zone status, which brought in financial incentives at just the right moment when the sites were ready for development. Um, and uh, the businesses were attracted to that area. And there are now uh, 10,000 jobs there um, on those sites in the Dern Valley that previously wouldn't have been there. I would agree that, you know, there is a problem about what sort of jobs you're attracting. I'd also um, actually um, uh, agree with um, the problem that Tim is, is mentioning about um, sometimes these jobs are not even filled by locals. Um, some employers have been unscrupulous and look for the cheapest labour possible 
And even though they've been able to get cheap labour at home, they've actually recruited cheap labour from uh, Romania and Bulgaria. Um, I've got to say, now that the Britain has left the European Union, that, that way forward will no longer be possible for those, uh, for those employers. Um, but it has meant that at least some of the benefits um, of that job growth have not flown, have not flowed to the people who, um, uh, for whom the regeneration was in, originally intended. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and, and and thank you, Tim. And I think you know, if I was to to summarise, um, you know, the 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 presentation and the talk, um, we don't have uh, all the answers, but I think you know, we we've been through this process, we've been through this transition. It's taken us a long time. Some things have not worked well. Some, you know, there's some great positive examples there that you mentioned there uh, as well, Steve. And and I think what what you've done is is given us a really crystal clear um, uh, insight into um, the approach that's needed. I think that's what, what I'm hearing. If, if we get the approach uh, right and thought through carefully and in a considered way, then the outcomes will no doubt speak for themselves. And I think that approach is, involves a lot of things coming together through the planning, through the management process, through the financial incentives, looking at um, not just the quick wins and the quick fixes, but um, the multitude of, of of different things that need to come together uh, in 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 this transition to make it to make it successful and and to make it work. So with that, I just want to thank Tim and Steve for your valued uh, contributions. It's given us lots to th lots and lots of things to to think about. Um, just to remind our our audience, we're going to have a, an hour's lunch break, and then we will be joined this afternoon. Um, uh, the first session will be on European policy considerations and, and priorities, and we will be building on the two um, uh, conversations that we've already had. But there's there's a lot that's that's coming together um, in in this in this conversation. But um, I want to thank you. Enjoy your lunch break, and want my my thanks again to to Steve uh, and to Tim for taking the time for being with us. And Steve, we will see you um, yeah. uh, later on this good. afternoon in the lesson for the future section. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Bye. Welcome back everyone. I hope you managed to uh, have a have a good lunch break and and get refreshed and energized um, and ready for the the, the afternoon session. Um, I'm certainly finding the the conversation um, really uh, energizing and and particularly uh, insightful as well and I think we've we're hearing lots of stories um, about uh, the history that the UK has gone through in our transition uh, away from coal, and I and I really hope that it's helping um, uh, you as our delegates to to give some thoughts and provide some ideas as to what you can do within your own uh, uh, within your own remits, within your own uh, portfolios, and what it means for your country going forward uh, transitioning away from coal. I, I completely understand that this is not an easy conversation to have. There are many, many challenges ahead, not just uh, from a socio-economic point of view, but um, uh, politically and uh, environmentally. Um, and th like we're hearing, it's it's not something that's going to happen overnight. And what we are really committed to doing is helping uh, support your transition as best as we can um, with, uh, our, with our the best guidance that we can provide with the insights that we can provide through the conversations that we've been having uh, today. So over to um, this uh, session this afternoon, what we're we're going to be uh, joined by um, uh, a list of, of uh, keynote speakers and and the focus of this session is about European policy uh, considerations. And I think the most important thing that I would like to say here is that um, with the Paris Agreement, the Paris Agreement stated that the creation uh, that the creation of um, uh, decent work and quality jobs in accordance with nationally defined development priorities is a real a cornerstone for imperatives for a just transition, and that was in 2015. And the ILO have also um, uh, lifted that that 
um, the Paris Agreement uh, uh, commitments and provided guidelines as to how that transition needs to take place, uh, planning in, in, uh, in investments and sustainable jobs, but it needs to be done in a manner that addresses inequality, fuel poverty, but as well as designing and delivering low carbon infrastructure. So the landscape is there before us, but the challenges from a practical point of view is, is huge. But what I would like to do is again, welcome you back. And um, this session will be joined by three speakers. The first I would like to uh, draw attention to is Sabrina Muller. She's a policy analyst uh, on sustainability finance um, and she's based at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at the uh, London School of Economics and Political Science. So without further ado I would like to invite the first of our presenters to, to come and give her, her thoughts on our just transition from coal European policy considerations and priorities and just to remind everyone if you'd like to ask a question um, and um, if you could just raise your hand in the chat box um, and then you're welcome to to talk directly to to any of our uh, uh, speakers uh, this afternoon so again uh, welcome back and uh, good afternoon Sabrina and we're really looking forward to your your thoughts and insights to this hugely hugely challenging uh, uh, environment on on just transition uh, from from coal many thanks Justine and uh, hello everyone it's uh, great to be here today um, so yes um, at my my role at the LSE is very much focused on um, sustainable finance, uh, mainly on the a role of finance in driving forward a just transition, which is also uh, what I'll be focusing on in my presentation today. So as is well known by now, the transition to a net zero economy can bring significant economic and social benefits with great job creation potential, also importantly for good quality jobs. But in order for these benefits to come to life, the transition will need to be managed well. If it is not managed well, there are considerable social risks that can leave workers and even communities and countries um, dependent on economic activity related to coal stranded in the transition. So it's really critical that the social implications, both on the upside and on the downside, are carefully considered, which is what the just transition has at its heart. In the past years, it has become clear that climate policies risk failure if they don't take into account the effects on employment, communities and consumers, with the most prominent example being the Gilets jaunes protests. Also, COVID-19 has revealed and also deepened inequalities and vulnerabilities in the global economy, making the just transition more crucial than ever and making it essential um, that it builds a core part of COP26. Um, so we can say that ensuring that the just transition is socially equitable and just is a critical enabling factor to progress on the path away from coal. So with that, I basically outlined why the just transition is important, but I'd also like to make sure I'm being really clear on what exactly it is we at the LSE mean by a just transition, because in my experience, that is not always 100% straightforward with um, different definitions applied by different actors. Um, so the just transition was included in the Paris Agreement, as Tessine has said in her introduction, um, to ensure respect for the labor and human rights of workers that are impacted by climate action. It's about managing the social impacts of climate change, both on the upside and on the downside. And that covers, on the one hand, the transition out of a high carbon reality, with coal, of course, playing a huge role here, um, making sure that workers, communities and consumers which in our view are the key priority groups in the transition, are not left behind. On the other hand, it also includes the transition into net zero, making sure that opportunities are realized and there's inclusive access to them. This can be done through five key principles, maximizing the social benefits of climate action while mitigating the social risks stand at the core here. And um, in the process uh, to a just transition, it will need to be ensured that those impacted by changes are included in decision making. And we plan the transition carefully as orderly transitions are more likely to be just. Underpinning all of this will be finance, both from public and private sources to ensure investments are made where they're most needed. 
Now, as I'm sure you're all aware, a small but growing number of countries are introducing specific just transition initiatives, with the EU leading here with its just transition mechanism. The US is also an example with its focus on good quality jobs in Biden's executive order on climate change, um, but efforts also extend to emerging markets with um, South Africa, for example, developing a just transition framework. Um, now, businesses are also starting to act and also financial institutions are recognizing their responsibility and role in delivering a just transition. Until recently, most financial institutions have managed climate change primarily as an environmental driver of risk and return, but with the structural change that's required for the net zero transition, a rounded perspective is needed to move away from looking at environmental, social and governance factors separately and rather view them as inherently connected. For financial institutions, there's a range of reasons for action around the just transition and investors are leading the movement here among financial institutions. They first signaled the importance of the just transition to them in 2018, when more than 160 institutions with over 10 trillion US dollars under manage, in assets under management signed a statement of commitment with additional initiatives also kicking off in the past year. The challenge now is to translate this growing ambition of investors into operational action in a way that brings real change in corporate behavior. Financial institutions need practical tools for this. And that is really what we're focusing on with our work at the LC. So about three years ago, um, we started a project on investors specifically with another one following shortly after focused on banks with the aim of driving forward concrete action in this space. And born out of this work and recognizing the need for collaboration and partnership approaches to tackle the challenge, we formed the Financing and Just Transition Alliance. With over 40, mem uh, 40 members covering investors and banks, but also research institutes, trade union representatives and local stakeholders. Most of them are headquartered in the UK um, or their specific UK branches are part of the alliance, but most have global operations. Within the alliance, we've looked at three areas specifically business action with financial institutions and their client and shareholder engagement at the forefront. Then place-based action, which is crucial given that benefits and risks in the transition are not equally distributed across localities. And then policy action, which is essential to build an enabling environment for finance to actively support a just transition. Now, on the business side, in July, we've published a report outlining a framework for financial institutions on what they can reasonably expect on the just transition from the businesses they interact with. And we did this by drawing on established conventions and guidance, including from the UN, the ILO and the OECD, as well as energy specific frameworks by Harvard and first investor led initiatives. This is based on our view that for financial institutions, taking steps to support the just transition is not an exercise in invention, but rather in connection of the environmental and the social dimensions, notably by applying well-established social and labor standards into climate action strategies. So drawing on these existing efforts, we have developed a consolidated set of seven just transition expectations for use by financial institutions. And the first of these dimensions um, is strategy. So establishing a company plan for the just transition. Second, we have workers focusing on delivering good jobs and decent work in the transition and respect for worker and human rights, as well as promoting and providing reskilling and retraining. Third is supply chain, which speaks to supporting suppliers, including SMEs in the just transition also social and environmental due diligence and policies should be applied. Then communities, so engaging with local communities to address the social risks of transitions to regional economies, partnering with local communities to share value in net zero and resilience investments is equally important. Um, consumers, supporting them in terms of affordable access to key goods and services in the transition and enabling consumers to participate actively in the transition policy and partnerships, which includes advocating for the just transition within the context of industry associations and in lobbying of government, as well as supporting partnerships for the just transition to net zero. 
And lastly, we have transparency and disclosure covering uh, reporting on just transition policies and performance. And in our report, we apply this framework to five European case studies in the energy sector. Enel, EDF, SSE, E.ON and the Polish company ZPAC. To just give a high level summary of the key insights from the case studies, um, we, we found that catalysts for action around the just transition vary greatly. Uh, from social dialogue with workers and trade unions to engagement with shareholders and the tightening of policy. Transparency and disclosure on the just transition is still quite at an early stage, um, but it is of course essential for investors and other stakeholders to hold companies accountable. Um, and looking across the five case, case studies, there is limited consistency um, between companies in terms of transparency and disclosure. A key priority will therefore be um, need to be or need to be um, to make sure that uh, reporting on the just transition becomes part of routine climate and sustainability disclosure. Another thing that really struck us um, was that the case studies draw on similar foundations in terms of core sustainability and human rights frameworks, such as the SDGs or the UN guiding principles. Um, but in terms of a clear strategic basis that has been made publicly available, the examples vary considerably with only SSE having a dedicated strategy on the just transition. Um, an SSE strategy, which, which is a um, Scottish uh, energy company, covers 20 principles and centers around both transitioning into a net zero world and transitioning out of a high carbon world, covering workers and jobs, of course, um, but also focusing on supply chains, communities and consumers. SSE has so far made good progress on its transition to net zero by 2050. Um, it's closed its last remaining coal plant in March 2020 and heavily developed its renewable pipeline over the past years as well. SSE was also part of the Scottish Just Transition Commission, which I'll go into more detail on um, in just a moment. Um, so quite strong there as well in terms of uh, policy dialogue. Now, if net zero is the what, the goal we want to achieve, then the just transition is the how, the way we get there. We're now at a pivotal moment for driving the just transition beyond broad recognition to tangible action from businesses with real world outcomes. New assessment initiatives will be important catalysts to kick this off. One by Climate Action 100 Plus is currently underway, which brings together over 570 investors to coordinate engagement with companies that account for over 80% of corporate industrial GHG emissions worldwide. They're currently developing a just transition indicator, which will be included in their net zero benchmark. Another is the World Benchmarking Alliance, which looks to assess 450 companies in high emitting sectors by 2023 on their contribution to address transition and also the Council for Inclusive Capitalism, which is looking to develop a framework for action for businesses in a collaborative effort with leading companies, investors and nonprofits. Moving on to the next pillar of the Alliance work, which is place based action. Um, I'll only go over this quickly, as I know there was a local session this morning. So just briefly, um, net zero will be turned into a reality at the local level and will play out very differently in different localities with existing disparities such as regional inequalities needing to be taken into account. We're very engaged in the work of the Place Based Climate Action Network, a university led network in the UK with representation also from Leeds, Edinburgh, Belfast and Surrey. And what we've kept on hearing from our local partners was that there was no shortage of ideas for projects, but they couldn't quite manage to connect them to finance. And what we've been hearing from our exchanges with financial institutions was that there was no shortage of money for local climate projects, but um, there was no bankable or investable pipeline. So what seems to be missing is the middle layer um, to develop projects and connect them to the finance available. So we've been looking to develop local climate finance hubs that would be doing exactly that and consol consolidate projects to give them the scale for financial institutions to consider them. Now, um, coming to the last pillar of the alliance, which is the policy frameworks. So as I've outlined previously, financial institutions and businesses are starting to actively support the just transition 
but these are relatively new and small scale. While there's a lot more the private sector can do on its own, strong policy frameworks are also needed to deliver the systemic change that we need, and these will need to cover two areas to build an effective basis for finance. Um, the just transition will need to be integrated in real economy policies that target net zero, and the just transition will, will also need to be embedded in financial policies. In terms of real economy policies, we think it'll be important to include the just transition in all policies that aim at supporting net zero. In the UK, there is a specific net zero strategy in the works, uh, which should strongly consider social factors as well to be effective. One way through which this can be supported is by setting up a just transition commission. Um, and this commission would give expert guidance uh, to the whole of government on how fairness can best be delivered on the ground, how to maximize opportunities and protect the vulnerable. The commission could be made up of representatives from trade unions, finance, local government, civil society and academia, and would need to reflect regional diversity as well. Such a commission has actually been established already specific to Scotland, which a UK wide commission or of course a commission in a continental European country could draw on. The Scottish one was established in 2019 and published its final report earlier this year, laying out opportunities and challenges, as well as next steps to deliver an inclusive transition. Now, um, the Scottish Just Transition Commission's recommendations included some key ones on finance. I won't go into all of them now, as I'm afraid we don't have time for that. But um, they included, for example, that business support should align with the Just Transition, that targeted efforts should be made to build up local low carbon supply chains, that public funding should be conditional on fair work terms, and the cost for consumers should consider the financial standing of households. Um, now to spend some time on um, some additional finance relevant policies that came out of our work within the Financing Interest Transition Alliance. We developed these for the UK specifically, but I think many of them can translate to other country contexts as well. Um, especially, for example, on fiscal policy, which needs to be a key area tying into the consumer point again. For example, ensuring that uh, carbon taxes consider and mitigate impacts on low income households. Public banks are also essential. The newly established UKIB has its dual mandate of supporting net zero and local economic development. So if these two are brought together, it's really predestined to have uh, just transition impact. And uh, public procurement is another area where social factors should be considered, for example, through the lens of social value, which combines economic, environmental and social considerations. Among the tools policymakers have available are also sovereign bonds. In October last year, we at the LSE, together with the Green Finance Institute and the Impact Investing Institute, published a report on our idea of a Green Plus sovereign bond that could combine um, environmental and social objectives. And uh, we were very pleased to hear the government announce that for its green bond, it would report on the social co-benefits. So at least in its disclosure, cover both environmental and social factors, which we hope will translate into increased ambition on social impact as well. The first of these bonds launched in September and had um, really good take up from the market. So as we've seen, policy action is stepping up and corporate as well as finance champions on the just transition are emerging, showing how the just transition can become an operational reality. Um, but these efforts are incomplete, both in terms of depth of ambition and robustness and breadth across regions. And even though today's events um, are focused on coal, of course, also sectors. Um, priority areas that have emerged from our work on sustainable finance include promoting convergence towards common approaches to help investors avoid reinventing the wheel and enable standardization. The expectations framework we developed could be a helpful starting point for this. Then understanding better the role of participation in just transition plans to develop replicable models for worker and community participation in corporate decision making. And ultimately, the just transition is about tangible improvements to people li people's lives. So the credibility of the just transition will be enhanced by showing how business action is leading to real world outcomes. Then looking at the place-based dimension of the just transition, 
that considers the existing inequalities in different localities and looks at the likely, likely regional and local impacts of the transition, promoting innovative solutions um, that can help investors and banks think in terms of place, such as the local climate finance hubs idea. And then coming to the policy side, the just transition will need to be placed at the center of net zero real economy policies and lastly, financial policies will need to be designed taking into account the just transition. And with that, I think um, I've taken up more than enough time uh, now, and I'm going to hand back to you, Tassine, for the next speaker. Thank you, Sab thank you, Sabrina. And um, it's it's really great to see the efforts that are being put in place, and certainly through the the just transition, the financing, the just transition. Uh, alliance, just the very fact that there's so many interested parties as testimony in itself uh, as to the level of interest um, to be part of the conversation. And it's often the, the biggest hurdle is to get people through the first door uh, and then the rest will kind of like speak for itself. But um, but for now, uh, Sabrina, I'll, I'll come back uh, with, with, with some questions for you and we'll, we'll have some questions from our audience. Uh, but for now, Sabrina, thank you very much for your, for your, for your insights there. And I'd now like to welcome Chris Radjuski, who is a pro program advisor um, from Powering Pasco Alliance, um, to give his thoughts on European policy considerations, which is where we where really need to be at if we want to see some structural change uh, in in Eastern Europe. So Chris, very uh, warm welcome and good afternoon and we're looking forward to you to your thoughts. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and, and thank you for the introduction. I'm hope hoping that my screen is, is sharing adequately. So let me get this. Um, so my name is Chris Radievsky and I'm a program advisor with the Powering Pass Coal Alliance and great to sort of speak to you about sort of what's happening internationally and specifically from a European conversation as you mentioned uh, but also talk a little bit more about the alliance and sort of the momentum that you know as an international organization and particularly one that is extremely active in Europe you know we can have sort of an impact but also get to see a lens on, on sort of how things are moving not just from an angle of just transition but but coal phase out more broadly. So maybe if I can just start with a little bit about the Powering Pass Coal Alliance. So the PPCA is the world's first and only coalition of national and subnational governments, as well as businesses working to advance the transition away from unabated coal power generation. And so ultimately that's saying that we have you know, representation and membership globally, but from many different camps. So as much as governments are involved, um, utilities as well as financial institutions. And you know, Sabrina just spoke to the role that financial institutions can play in a just transition. Ultimately, it's great to have all these actors at the table as part of this alliance. Ultimately, when a company or a government is looking to join the PPCA, they're committing to a number of things. That is one, to secure commitments from governments and the private sector on exiting unabated coal as applicable, recognizing that there's a number of subnational governments and cities um, who are working on elements of just transition, but as many know and run into challenges as part of that, they don't have the policy levers to ultimately affect uh, all of the changes themselves. So. Furthermore, we are encouraging a global moratorium on the construction of new unabated coal fire power plants. And I can speak more to that in my presentation because there is quite the shift that is going on that front. Um, ultimately, we are hoping that we can shift investment from coal to clean energy uh, by working with partners uh, to restrict finance for coal fired projects. We've seen the pipeline for international coal finance continue to dwindle uh, and I'll speak more to that as well. And then finally, ultimately, what we're speaking about today is a key theme, just transition. How do we achieve coal phase out in an inclusive way that includes proper support for workers and communities? Ultimately, um, the declaration that countries sign on to is um, twofold. So it's focused at governments, but there is applicability for financial institutions and others. Um, those that are operating in the OECD or OECD countries need to commit to a 2030 phase out in line with a 1.5 uh, degree scenario target and then ultimately 2050 for the rest of the world. So, you know, to break that down, if you're a national government and you have control of the policy levers, you're 
joining the PPCA and committing to a phase out um, in line with your OECD slash EU status. Um, ultimately, as we go forward, taking a look at our membership, we comprise over 130 members worldwide. And speaking more in terms of the EU context, 19 of the EU 27 are members, but we also have membership within the Western Balkans and regions as well. So that's 41 national governments from around the world. Additionally, 41 subnational governments, and this ultimately, you know, the question is always asked, and there may be some of you who are representing local communities on the call today. You know, why would a local government without the policy levers join the PPCA? Um, ultimately, in some times it's about advocacy um, and you know it doesn't matter if you know you can't have all of the all of the power to yourself eastern Wielka Polska the first member um, within Poland to join at a subnational level joined earlier this year in June 2021 Sabrina mentioned uh, Zipak in her presentation and ultimately a company that joined the PPCA as well based in eastern eastern Wielka Polska that has affected the transition there while they don't have all the policy levers at a government level, they've taken the steps that they can do to affect a transition by 2030, uh, but also work to advocate with other regional or national governments in terms of affecting uh, the next steps on change. Um, finally, as well, private sector members. We have over 55 that include financial companies, utilities, and other companies. I mentioned Zipak um, joining in Eastern Polska, but also financial companies. Um, what I should mention is that financial institutions that join the PPCA ultimately sign on to the PPCA declaration that I spoke about earlier, but also make a commitment to key finance principles, um, which ultimately uh, outline the key steps that financial institutions can take towards executing along the lines of the, um, the PPCA declaration, since the PPCA declaration is more of a, of a government focus. And all of this is in a global call to consign coal to history. As many of you may know, the COP president designate has put out a call for jurisdictions to consign coal to history in advance of COP. But this also aligns with a broader call that has been made by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, who has, you know, really called for one, um, the phase out of coal, but also the, the prevention of no new coal in the interim to ensure that we meet a 1.5 degree scenario. Maybe to turn a little bit to sort of the focus on Europe at this point, we have continued momentum in terms of coal phase out across um, in advance of COP26 across Europe and the Western Balkans. Um, I mentioned sort of the 19 of the EU 27, but in addition to that, um, we had a number of countries um, join the West uh, from the slash EU slash Western Balkans, and that included Albania, Croatia, Montenegro, and North Macedonia all joined the PPCA. And furthermore, when we're speaking about Central and Eastern Europe, this builds on momentum that has seen current PPCA members like Hungary and like Greece who have accelerated their phase out to 2025. And ultimately this comes on the back of Austria that has already just fully phased out coal and Slovakia, which will phase out coal by 2023. So it's very um, enlightening, it's very encouraging to see the pace of momentum and the shifts that are occurring across Europe and particularly in Central and Eastern Europe. However, that is to say, and this really comes home when we talk about a just transition, that 97% of the EU's remaining 50 gigawatts of coal capacity are not covered by a phase out commitment. And I think that's a very poignant point. And I'm actually going to pull some of the words that Sabrina used in her presentation, which is an orderly transitions are more likely to be just. And I think that's incredibly important is that countries that have set a phase out date can ultimately start to plan and ensure that economics don't shift them aside. We've seen sort of the impact of short-term economics, rise in coal prices, rise in natural gas prices. Ultimately, countries that are able to plan effectively for these transitions can ensure that these communities are not left behind. And I think that's uh, that's super critical. But you know, there are probably more on this call that can speak better to that and, and to know firsthand about some of the challenges that they're facing. In addition, uh, no new coal. I think it's one thing to talk about coal phase out, and there is a challenge on coal phase out, but ultimately a good chunk of the world, including still some of the cent central and eastern Europe, is planning for new coal. Now, while we are talking about planning for no new coal, it should be a very positive message to show that 76% of the proposed projects um, as of mid-September of this year 
have actually dropped off um, since the Paris Agreement in 2015. And that's that's very positive. And you can sort of see the size as it relates to that, you know, from 15, 53 gigawatts to 482. It's significant. And you can sort of see how that breaks down on a announced pre-permitted and permitted slash construction sort of sense. And ultimately, you know, if we had continued building along the rate that we were doing so um, or planning to, as you can see, the newly canceled line between 2016 and 2021, ultimately the challenge that we would be facing from a transition and from a just transition sense would have been much more difficult. As I mentioned earlier, China has announced ending international co-finance. I think that's a big step in terms of what, you know, ultimately was looking to plan to come online. And I think we will see the pipeline shrink incredibly um, further. That also builds on the fact that Korea and Japan have, you know, ultimately ended public finance. Um, on that point, I think, you know, speaking about our financial members, there is still a role to ensure that our financial members or financial institutions, you know, consider joining the PPCA and thinking about how are they affecting a coal phase out themselves and how are they working with um, companies to and utilities to affect this transition. And on that point, just before I continue with the slide, I would say that the, from the PPCA perspective, we don't take a divestment approach. We ultimately recognize that, you know, just transition requires engagement and it requires work. And so ultimately we support financial institutions who are engaging with companies and regions to ensure that while financing is in place, steps are being taken to ensure a just transition is in place. And ultimately, um, Sabrina drew on some of those examples in terms of how those are affected, um, but also, you know, still laying out very clearly clearly that there is a need to transition. You know, this can't go on indefinitely. Um, again, just sort of building on the on the China announcement, you know, Turkey has do, Turkey is a country sort of within the, you know, Europe, bordering Europe region, which is one of, I'd say, a success story to a certain degree. I think credit where credit is due, you know, from 80 gigawatts 10 years ago to 12 gigawatts planned today. Um, ultimately, in light of the, uh, the announcement to end international finance by China, the 12 gigawatts that are planned, um, the likelihood that those go forward um, is, in, is lower, is incredibly lower. And I think so, as it relates to no new coal, there's a positive message. And this has actually been built on by a coalition of countries that launched a no new coal power compact at the UN high level dialogue on energy that took place at the UN General Assembly uh, two weeks ago. So ultimately, there really is a push and on the no new coal front. There is a push in front of COP26 to really answer Alok Sharma's call to consign coal to history. Um, with that, um, I think, you know, there will be more opportunity for discussion. And what I would do is I would invite those on the call that, you know, find it applicable to, to reach out and to get in contact. Um, you can see the momentum is shifting. And I think there are two sort of two folds to sort of the picture of the transition and the coal phase out and why being part of the PPCA um, it makes a difference. On the first hand, it's about signaling that momentum. It's about calling on other governments that haven't and other jurisdictions that haven't considered coal phase out to do so. And so that can be done within a manner of a very just transition. But then also there's an opportunity for participating through the PPCA. Of course, as I mentioned, with over 130 members across governments and uh, non-government organizations, we have uh, quite the breadth of experience and engagement to share. We've worked closely with the LSE and other partners um, to share experiences, to do research in terms of what our best practices and approaches. But I think ultimately it's this network and being able to connect with other countries and other jurisdictions that have considered um, how they approach or how they have actually dealt with just transition. Um, it may provide ideas, it may provide guidance. I recognize not every sort of um, pathway may be the best approach, but um, considering that every region needs to take a bespoke approach to their own situation. But ultimately, I think that is one of the big levers of the PPCA is that there is a real opportunity to learn from others who, you know, as I've mentioned, other countries who have already affected the transition. You know, there are still other countries in the Western Balkans and in CEE where there is still quite a difficult road ahead. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back uh, to yourself to see. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. And it's, it is wonderful to hear um, about the Alliance itself. Um, and this journey to, to a just transition can be a very lonely place as well. Um, and I think that one about strength in numbers and learning 
uh, from each other and supporting each other is is an important part of this uh, of this phase. Um, and it's really great that you were able to to share that. Um, I will come back to you, Chris, um, with with some questions and thoughts. It relates to uh, some of the thoughts that you'd presented there, and and Sabrina also. Um, but I want to to thank you for now, Chris. Um, and I'll see you in a, in a little bit. Just to remind our audience, if you'd like to ask a question. Uh, please raise your hand um, and, and I'll get to you directly. So the third of our speakers is Michael Catrizzi, who's formerly a researcher at the University of Edinburgh. So Michael, uh, we really look forward to hearing your insights onto the European policy considerations that are that need to be thought through in our transition uh, away from coal. Hi there, thank Good you. Good afternoon, Sue. Michael, you're welcome. Um, it seems I can't use the video function on the web browser at the same time as presenting. I'm sorry about that. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes, we can. Could Great. you just put it up to slideshow and then we're good to go. Thanks, Michael. Excellent. OK, so thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you all today. I hope um, I can pick out some insights that are helpful for this audience. So. Um, yeah, I, I conducted this research with the UK Energy Research Centre um, when I was a researcher at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and it was with Professor Jim Watson and Joanna Getsobullo, who can't join us today. Um, but the, the focus of the research was about the role of the big six energy companies in the UK in transitioning um, to low carbon electricity system. Um, so the aim was to understand to what extent their um, strategies, their approaches, their investments were compatible with um, the transition to low carbon electricity system. And our methods were a combination of semi-structured interviews with company representatives and also additional analysis of the documents um, available in terms of company reports and so on. Um, very briefly here, I just want to emphasize that in the UK, generation companies operate independently as independent companies from retail companies and from transmission and distribution distribution companies. Although, of course, as you probably know, um, they can function as part of a, a larger multinational vertically integrated company. And that's what the big six are. They're large um, vertically integrated companies with with subsidiary companies in, in these different arms. So when we set out to do this research, we wanted, we, we, we drew on the literature that had some useful insights. So we knew that um, a small number of firms have been dominating the UK electricity and retail markets in the UK since the early 2000s. We know that um, the market conditions favoured vertical integration and that um, Frank Hills and colleagues pointed out that it looked like we the UK seems to be on an incumbent led transition um, where the the big six companies and and other large companies are are um, transitioning um, their own portfolios rather than being disrupted. But we know that large companies are, are vulnerable to disruption and we wanted to see, we're amidst all the talk of disruption, to what extent are we seeing some disruption in, in that? Um, are, are we seeing these incumbents being disrupted in the UK electricity system? So the big six are these six companies um, listed on the left there. And just to give you a sense of scale, um, in 2010, towards the beginning of the period that we're looking at, um, these companies held 69% of Great Britain's market share in terms of how much generation they sold that year, and 99% of the retail market uh, in terms of number of customers. If we fast forward to the end of the period that we're looking at, um, they definitely lost market share as a... Um, as as a collective of companies, um, you know, so some other co companies grew in market share, but they remain dominant as the incumbents. Um, so how did this 
come about. These are large, um, many of them European companies, four out of the six are, um, are large European uh, international companies. Um, so we know since the 2000s, EU directives have been driving out um, large combustion plants and been making it harder for those plants to stay competitive. Um, in addition, the UK has had UK renewables obligation and the Climate Change Act and electricity market reform, all encouraging investment in low carbon generation. So what I've got here is a graph of the generation portfolios of each of those six companies. And it takes a snapshot in time um, from May 2008, for example, here, through to May 2012, through to 2018. So for each company, you can see how their portfolio changed. In black, we have coal. In red, we have nuclear. Gray, we have gas. And these lighter colors, light green is onshore wind. Dark, dark blue is um, offshore wind. So I want to go through each one and show you that the, the six companies responded to these policy changes um, in different ways. And some, um, some were winners, some were losers, you might say. So starting with the Scottish companies, Scottish Power um, began investing in large renewables early. Um, so before 2008, they already had a small portfolio. And because they did that quite early, they benefited the most from doing so. They attracted interest from Iberdrola, a large Spanish um, wind power generator gen uh, company. Um, and Iberdrola pumped in lots of investment and gradually helped the company to pursue a 100% renewable strategy. Um, so they've gained the most market share, um, especially in renewables, and they've done quite well in the transition. Quite similarly, SSE invested early on in renewables, um, but they also um, continued to invest in gas and coal co-firing plants. And that cost them quite a lot unexpectedly in 2012 when the operating costs um, for those power plants just went too high because of wholesale prices. So um, they ended up keeping the plants, but not running them. And then as a result, they scaled down their investments. So they lost out on further investments in renewables and they lost market share uh, by the end of the period. Let's turn now to EDF here, Electricity de France. Um, so here you have a company that is and that has access to huge amounts of capital. It can borrow at cheaper rates than other companies um, because it's state backed. And of course, it has huge expertise in nuclear power and a long track record. Um, so they have they have long history of investing in maintenance and innovation in their large power plants. So they actually extended the life of the nuclear power plants and upgraded their coal power plants to comply with the industrial emissions directive, despite it becoming increasingly difficult to do so. Um, they made some minor investments in renewables, like you know, using the renewables obligation to, to win some subsidies from the UK government, but, um, but these were only minor. And as coal continued to be deprioritized in the UK's electricity, electricity system, they too have phased out their coal power plants. Now, Centrica is the next one. Centrica in 2008 realized that they were too exposed to gas prices. And gas prices had risen and it hit them more than any other UK energy company. Um, so they wanted to try and diversify their generation portfolio by um, investing in different types of power generation. 
So they invested with EDF in the nuclear power plants uh, owned previously by British Energy. And so they, they've got a small proportion of that, hence why they've got a small, small amount of nuclear here. Um, and they started investing in renewables, but they realized that they couldn't do this as competitively as other companies. And actually, since this change of CEO, um, I think it was in 2013, um, they realized that they were less competitive in this market and they started focusing on smaller scale projects, distributed energy in the UK, um, gas investments in nuclear in, in North America, and yeah, broadly have been divesting from uh, centralized generation in the UK. Lastly, we have the two large German companies. So firstly, let's take E.ON, um, who had a big generation portfolio in 2008, predominantly um, gas and coal and other fossil fuel. Um, E.ON, a bit like EDF, had access to huge amounts of capital. So they had a, and they knew that a lot of their power plants, their gas and coal power plants would have to be retired um, because of the industrial emissions directive. So they had a plan to invest heavily in developing coal and gas generation sites across Europe in 2008 to replace those sites. In the UK, they began developing two large coal plants, um, but at the time there were high profile environmental protests against those uh, coal plants. And there were also declining returns for coal. So eventually they abandoned this idea. Next, they started focusing on high capital, high risk projects, um, such as nuclear power stations, uh, new nuclear. Um, but then a combination of changes in Germany as part of the energy wind um, posed serious challenges to the multinational business. So a rapid expansion of small scale renewable energy generation disrupted, um, yeah, meant they faced disruption in their business model. There was an abandonment of nuclear power in Germany and also increased costs on their power plants because they were oil indexed. So as a result, E.ON scaled down their investments and didn't invest so much in renewables. Um, and they've lost market share a lot in the UK, a lot, yeah. RWE um, are another large German company and they've um, got a very similar story to E.ON. They started with the largest generation portfolio by capacity um, in the UK. And it was also the most fossil fuel dominated one. Um, they, again, they tried to make serious investments in coal and gas plants, um, as well as some large scale renewables in the UK, more so than E.ON. But they faced the same challenges as E.ON and also lost their position, uh, actually lost their position as the largest owner of UK gen generation capacity by 2018. So you've got some companies there who have yeah, every company has taken a different approach and, and some have better benefited more than others. So just to draw some conclusions there, um, we see that the big six companies through a, um, changing their strategies and investments, they have succeeded in powering past coal and wading off disruption on the whole in the UK. Um, they have all seen, they have collectively seen a reduction in their market share for generation and retail, but they remain dominant in both markets. Their generation market transition was supported by a policy environment, is supported by a policy environment that works with the centralized nation of the UK's energy market. So policies favored the incumbents transitioning from one type of large scale generation investment to another quite different from Germany's where, where it's been opened up and um, you've seen a bit more, you've seen a lot more disruption. But it's, a, it's important to emphasize that individual companies had varying, varying degrees of success. Um, 
and that depended on their specific company profiles and the decisions of their European parent companies and, and the conditions that they faced. Um, EDF had a lot more stability than RWE, for example. The companies who have taken the most advantage of the transition, such as Scottish Power, used their huge, huge resources and early point to invest in renewables early and attracted investment from others to, to help along the way. Um, thank you for listening. Um, that's my email address today if anyone has any questions um, or would like to follow up. Um, Ioanna doesn't know this, but I, I volunteer here to give this presentation in Greek, if that's helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, and I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for talking us through that that case study about the, the big six. And it's, it's always nice to get that sense of um, realism, I guess, um, because it's not an abstract thing. It's you know we 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 hear about Scottish Power, we know about Ibadrola, we know about um, Eon and so on. So it's nice to have that that perspective and and talk us through that. I'm wondering, could I invite Chris and Sabrina to just undo their videos and and join us? Um, and indeed, to our audience, if you have questions, please do raise your hand and ask any of our members any uh, questions that that you would you would like to to pose to them. So. Uh, I guess going going back to the, to the very beginning, uh, Sabrina, um, and and the frameworks that, that you presented for financing a, a just transition, um, and you'd mentioned in your in your talk that some of the that process and that journey still is new and it's still relatively small scale, um, and complete. I'm wondering, could you maybe reflect on how do we overcome that small scaleness in this transition? And where do you see the biggest bottlenecks lie so that it doesn't remain small scale and that we are able to really, you know, push faster uh, on this journey? Sure, thanks a lot. Um, so I think, um, what in our experience with financial institutions, it's still quite the just transition is still quite a nascent issue. Of course, within the Financing and Just Transition Alliance, we um, do work with financial institutions who are very aware of the importance of the just transition um, and want to learn more about what they can do um, to bring it forward. Um, but that's uh, that's really the the ones who have already understood that it's important to them and affecting their business. So I think in terms of awareness raising, we still have um, a little bit of a way to go to also um, make the finance sector understand that the just transition is something that goes hand in hand with climate action. Um, and if, um, if climate action is not designed in a just way, um, that will also lead to higher costs or delayed shift to net zero, which then affects um, their bottom line. So it's very much also a financial relevance. Um, so that's, that's I think, some, a message that, um, that we can do more to bring to a broader range of uh, finance actors. Um, and in terms of what, what else can be done to really scale up action, I think the, um, the policy framework is quite a key part here as well. Um, so to really signal um, from a policy point of view that the just transition is is rooted in all of the um, of the climate relevant policies um, that are being uh, put underway from um, from a policymaker standpoint, uh, I think that that would really kick off um, push forward just transition action within the finance sector. Thanks, Sabrina. And, and I guess we we really do need to to get that awareness out there. And I'm wondering whether it's that the the confusion in the dialogue, because suddenly we're we're hearing about just transition and it's such a new concept, relatively new. I mean, those who are working in the area know very well what it is, but uh, for externals looking in, we get the transition part, but what do we mean? What is the just part? And uh, how do we measure it? How do we deal with it? Um, I'm just turning to you, Chris, with with um, not just about the 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 need to raise awareness, but to motivate 
change and to galvanize momentum around this. You mentioned um, China ending its kind of like commitment to to coal finance. To what extent do you see the biggest uh, economies, um, the biggest emitters, the G7, leading the way uh, for others to follow suit? And how much commitment do we need to see from the biggest world's economies that will drive incentive to other smaller nation states to phasing out coal? No, that's a great question. And, and maybe I'll just start by actually sort of dovetailing on the fact that speaking with family in, in Poland um, this this past weekend, I was trying to explain the concept of just transition and, and, you know, in a country where, you know, there is a lot of challenge in terms of the energy transition. And so you're, you're right. It, it's a concept that we still need to make a little bit more mainstream. And, you know, as part of the PPCA, we are trying to do that in, in terms of a broader transition, but there's great work that's being done and we do need to get this out there. So people do understand it because I think there is a little bit of shyness from, you know, the challenges of that will ultimately be with an energy transition and, you know, recent gas prices. If you live in the UK, like I do, I mean, in terms of gas shortages, you know, there's just anything that's around this energy sort of dialogue is, is causing apprehension with the general public and, and that won't help governments move. And to, and to your question on governments moving, I think, you know, governments have started to take action at the G7. We did see a commitment to decarbonize in the 2030s. And that's actually been followed up more recently by commitments in Canada, the United States, and, the, and Great Britain as well, to you know, to have you know clean energy systems ultimately by 2035, which you know is is a broader concept of just transition, just past coal, uh, in a sense of you know what Sabrina is sort of talking about, you know other sectors of just transition as well, not just coal, but ultimately it's the OECD. There you know there is capacity to lead, you know, and to meet a 1.5 degree scenario. We need to hit 2030. We need to meet those 2030 goals. And ultimately, we're going to be looking at countries like the United States to make sure that they do come in at 2030, not, you know, 2035 on coal. We do need to see um, Germany move earlier. And, you know, there is a lot of hints that it will move earlier. You know, I don't, it won't sort of presume on what the politics offers, but it seems like this was a climate election. At least that's what the experts were saying in Germany and that you will see whatever coalition look to shift a date forward. Um, at least that's what the courts have sort of instructed them to do. So you will see at least either push come to shove um, some shift forward in terms of the German context. But also, you know, countries outside of the G7, when we look broader at the G20, you know, the major industrialized countries, um, you also, also get to, into the non-OECD at that point. Um, they're going to need help. They're going to need help from these, these G20 countries. They're going to need help from the OECD. You know, there's been commitments for $100 billion, uh, in terms of the sort of, you know, for this climate transition. That, and, and the UK has been a big sort of... Um, champion in, in calling for that and supporting that transition. But ultimately, non-OECD countries cannot do this transition by themselves. Um, and particularly, it's going to come from a finance angle, but it's also going to come from an angle of uh, knowledge and best practice sharing in terms of the policy levers. And that comes down to just transition, because while these we, we, we do have these challenges in OECD countries and in heavy, heavy invested countries where it's on the mining and on the uh, transition front. And I should just clarify that the PPCA only works on um, energy transition on coal, not, not mining as well, though there are implications. But when we're talking about non-OECD countries where these are growing economies, they, you know, in, in line of sort of achieving an energy transition in line with sustainable development goal seven to ensure that there's universal access for energy. I think that complicates things and it needs to make us ensure that, you know, I'm going to quote Sabrina again, that we have an orderly transition to ensure that we're just in, we have an orderly transition to ensure that we can ensure that, that there is universal energy access that we can continue to provide sustainably, but ultimately still address climate challenges as well. Thanks, Chris, for that. And and I, I just want to reflect on that one point that you made there um, on, on finance. And Michael, if I could just turn my attention to you a little bit. In, in your presentation, I was very acutely aware of uh, the changes that um, some of the big six made more than others, particularly Scottish Power. But um, the thing that was driving that change was a huge investment. Uh, and the huge capital investment from Iberdrola. So without yeah. that financial support and commitment, where do we go? How do we do it? 
and Chris and Sabrina have both mentioned that it is it requires significant financial investment. So are we relying on um, EU uh, policy frameworks to to support this transition, or is it about um, working in in uh, in coalitions and in partnerships with others? C can you just give us your thoughts on on wh wh where do we go with that financial uh, challenge? It's a, it's a wonderful question. I'm, I'm afraid I'm not a finance expert. Um, I, I mean, EDF had access to capital because it was um, state backed, right? And, it, and it's, it's got those deep pockets. All of these companies do have deep pockets and it's a question of investing early um, and, and making the right call at the time. I don't know if, if Eon regretted trying to pursue coal plants at a time when um, everyone else was investing in, well, others were investing in renewables. Um, they, they, they would have kept more market share if they did that, I, you know, it's my opinion. Um, yeah, the money does have to come from somewhere. And um, yeah, Scottish, Scottish Power did an excellent job of attracting that investment from Iberdrola because they took the first steps. Um, you're going to see partnering you're, you're going to see partnering with other types of companies uh there's yeah there's other investors in this space who who want to disrupt things as well and and you can go find um investment from surprising sources sometimes um it's it's going to take a huge amount of investment and i can't say more than that I'm afraid. yeah no no honestly um it is a, it's a it's a challenging question and and i think you know we'll we'll, we'll come back to the finance aspect in in just a minute but uh, we've got a question in the chat box um from ailey watson the the just transition declaration at the last cop was motivated by concern from some uh coal dependent economies of the impact of decarbonisation on of, of co worker on co workers and their communities, but this wasn't uh, uh, widely signed by COP delegates. So how do we convince our governments that there is a political willpower internationally uh, for a just transition, especially as we come up to COP COP twenty six? I wonder um, if Sabrina, I could ask you to give your thoughts on that. Yeah, sure. So I think um, within the international policy space, we have seen um, the just transition take a different place um, in the past couple of years. I think um, with Biden taking taking office, that was also a key moment um, that signaled um, the U.S.'s importance of a just transition, especially when it comes to workers with the Biden's executive order on climate change, which was so focused on providing um, good paying union jobs. Um, also, of course, um, not all it's, as I said in my presentation, not only um, those key developing uh, developed countries that are now stepping into the space, there's also emerging markets that are moving. Uh, with which have, of course, a completely different challenge to the just transition. There's, for example, South Africa, which has, uh, as it stands, 44 percent of unemployment of an un unemployment rates. So of course, the just transition challenges there are um, are completely different, and these uh, are increasingly being acknowledged. So I think um, that compared to um, to the last COP, there has been a move from govern uh, from governments um, and there's been more awareness that has been attracted to the just transition which hopefully we'll see reflected at this COP as well. Thanks Sabrina and, and Chris your, your thoughts on that how do we convince um, our governments and certainly you know with, with your alliance it's a huge platform there to to be able to mobilize uh, movement and thinking uh, around that do you have any perspectives on on how your work through your alliance is able to influence uh, and convince governments? No, absolutely. Um, I think I'm bullish, similar to Sabrina, that this COP will see a continued focus on just transition. I think that comes with the momentum building. So I wouldn't, Ailey, I wouldn't lose hope just yet. Um, but in terms of the PPCA, absolutely. We have a number of subnational members that have joined the alliance because that is their way of 
calling on uh, an orderly transition, calling for a phase out date and, and calling for, you know, increased attention. We have had specific interest in coal regions and I'll use Eastern Vyalka Polska again as a Central and Eastern Europe member um, that, you know, has been working and has been affecting a transition locally, but needs to do more. And we've had other interest across Central and Eastern Europe in the same vein, because it's about getting some of these remaining countries that haven't set a full, a full plan in place necessarily to affect what is a transition and a just transition at that. And so ultimately, you know, again, I, I put the call out that, you know, those that are attending here today, if there is any interest, if you are from a community um, within one of these regions, if you are from a, you know, a regional government that doesn't have the policy priorities, there is an opportunity to join the PPCA. And I think as, as well, so coming back to the money, because it's always the full stop at the money, you know, financial institutions as well have quite the role here. And that's why we have seen quite the pickup in terms of financial institutions who are joining the PPCA to really one, send a signal to, and then align sort of some, you know, their policies as well. And ultimately, I think the way I would frame this in the, in the focus of the lead up to COP is that, you know, there's a quite a big focus, particularly in the financial space on net zero. But as ultimately, when push comes to shove, shove in terms of executing net, net zero, coal is the first step and coal and, and, and it's to be done properly. And, and if we don't do this step properly, if we don't figure it out, one, in terms of how we go about it, to one, may meet a 1.5 degree target, but two, if we don't do it in an orderly process, it's going to affect the other steps that come after that in terms of affecting meeting net zero. And so Cole's, you know, the way that we test this out, we try to get it right because ultimately, Sabrina mentioned this is related to other sectors, you know, this is going to cascade and we're going to need to do it again and again and again in different ways in an orderly transition. And if we don't, you know, ultimately, and we've started to see it in certain regions and jurisdictions where the economics is hitting first before um, there's an orderly transition in place. And ultimately then there's no support for these workers. Sure, we're losing a coal mine or sure we're losing a coal plant um, because it's uneconomical. But, and that helps meet our 1.5 degree target, but it's not the way we want to go about it. Yeah, no, no, Chris, that's, that's really uh, insightful. And I'm just thinking, um, we're hearing a lot about the, the Just Transition uh, Commission. You know, we have one in, in Scotland. Uh, Michael, can I just turn to you and ask you, is that the way to go? Is that the starting point? Do we need to see more Just Transition Commissions set up in different nation states to take uh, take stock and take onus and take responsibility? Is that is that a first step? <laughs> Um, I want to say yes, I, I, I think the other two speakers know more about the Just Transition Commission than I do, but I will say um, that I, from, yeah, the Just Transition Transition Com Commission can, um, can expand the type of voices that policymakers hear, and I think that's really necessary. I think if you look at what the big six companies were saying about transition, about transitioning to a low carbon electricity system in the UK in 2008, many were saying it's not possible to have so much market share in renewable uh, in renewables. It's not possible, you know, gas and coal will continue be, to be the cheapest and that's where they put their investments. There are people out there saying that this is possible and desirable and it can be done well. And I'd encourage the audience to listen to those voices and look for those voices because they might might not be the people that you normally speak to. Thanks, Michael, for that. And and Sabrina, I guess you were talking about the Just Transition uh, Commission. We're hearing a lot about that. And I think at the end of this one day uh, conference, we want to come up with this policy brief with some very concrete recommendations and pathways that we can recommend to our, our fellow delegates as to the next steps. Would you recommend that that is one of the ways in which we should start unpacking this journey? Yeah, so I think uh, Just Transition Commission can play a key role. So it was, uh, I would definitely say it's a beneficial way forward. It's certainly not the one and only um, solution to all our problems, but I think it's an important, uh, it can be an important starting point. And uh, what Michael said was absolutely on point, um, empowering those that will be impacted by the transition and giving them a voice in the decision making is a key part of the just transition. 
um, and a just transition commission um, can make this a reality. And I would um, add to that that um, for such a commission, it will be essential that it reflects regional and local voices as well, so that we ensure um, that the um, that climate decisions are not just made in a top-down manner at the national level and don't give um, adequate consideration to local realities and the impacts on local communities. So a Just Transition Commission can really ensure um, that these are taken into account. That's great. It's a, it's a very kind of like practical uh, first step, I guess, to to bring all stakeholders together uh, and to start on, on unpacking that. I'm sure, Chris, you will, you'll have your thoughts on if that's, that's a practical kind of like uh, first step on that pathway. I think so, and, and maybe it's not necessarily um, a, a just transition uh, council by itself or commission, um, but maybe it's in the sort of the broader context of a national coal commission. And I know uh, there's been a number of countries which have been considering this. Germany has, you know, went about their process through a national coal commission in terms of establishing a date. Um, Czech Republic, I think, is doing something similar. And so it, I wouldn't, I what I would say is I, I agree. I think it is a way forward, uh, but it can also be sort of looped in and it needs to be looped in if it's a broader coal commission in terms of the way forward then just transition needs to be talked about at the table because ultimately it very much uh, impacts when a data set how a data is set and the um, the tools in place to support that transition yeah thanks for that and and I think uh, I'm just looking at the time so I've got one one last question um for for, for each of you um and that's that one about the practical tools how do we how in your mind um do we need to design and develop those practical tools for a just transition not just to to describe what a just transition is but how do you develop tools that, that measure the impact or the difference a just transition can, can make do you have any thoughts on design and development of practical tools because this is where we're in we're in this space where people want um you know that that not just the concept but the practical approach, the practical methodology, the how to, uh, and uh, how do we, we 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 look at it going going forward? I'm wondering, Chris, if I could uh, get your thoughts on that, the practicality uh, of it all. It's great that you're starting with me because I think maybe I can tee this up for my other two colleagues um, effectively. I think one of the things, and I, I sort of mentioned in my presentation, is that there's a number of tools and there's a number of different approaches. And I think one of the key elements of membership in the PPCA or but also just even engaging with us and we're happy, you know, some jurisdictions are not in a position to join the PPCA, um, but may still need some of these practical know hows. And we work with a number of partners, the LSE being one of them and Sabrina um, and a number of other partners who work in this area where we can one help compile knowledge and, and and bring some of those policy levers and and best practices forward. And so it for for us, I think what I'm trying to say is the PPCA um, is a toolkit per se. It is a toolbox that where we can find a number of tools and best practices from across our membership and across our partners. And that could be a way forward for some of those that are listening today to engage further. So I did put my contact and I mentioned with the organizers, happy to share my slides and contact. And for those that are interested, we're happy to sort of, um, you know, follow up on those approaches and, and see what tools we can offer for different circumstances or at least connect um, with the experts. Great, thanks. Uh, and Sabrina? Yeah, thanks a lot, Chris, for that uh, that great uh, start to, <laughs> to my comment. So um, I think it's um, important to note when it comes to practical solutions that it's not all an invention exercise when it comes to the just transition. There are a lot of tools out there that are already in, in use, e either in the environmental space or in the social space um, that can be very helpful uh, for a just transition. And it's more a question of bringing those together and making them operational rather than coming up with something completely new that no one's ever thought about. Um, and that's what we've um, been trying to do with our framework. That's what we've we're trying to do in our work in general to bring these together to kind of integrate the environmental and the social. And there are also, um, for example, a lot of on the business side, there are um, different disclosure standards um, from the sustainability accounting standards board for disclosure initiative etc that have a lot of these elements in there they're not 
um, they don't cover everything. So there's a there's a certain element um, that we need to add to it. But it's a it can be a great start to kickstart action now because we can't wait years and years for uh, new tools to be developed, even though we have a lot of these uh, components already out there. And um, one thing I'd just like to add as well is that um, drawing on case studies and on cha uh, on champions um, in the just transition is really important to really um, showcase um, best practice um, that's out there in finance and in business um, with regards to policy and to give blueprint to uh, blueprints to others um, who want to learn from those are uh, is quite important which of course Chris you're doing in your work quite effectively. Thank you, uh, Sabrina and, and Michael. Any final thoughts as we head to a close on practical practical approaches? I don't think I can add anything to what the two speakers have said there. That's yeah, I didn't yeah, excellent points there. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Okay, well, I think um, the, the chat box is very, very quiet. And I think we've um, exhausted this conversation. There's a lot more that still need to be said and done. But I would like to just thank everyone for for your for your contributions. Um, uh, I think it's just a, a very hard conversation. Um, it's challenging uh, on, on all accounts. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's really great to hear about our experiences in the UK, because certainly this is what this platform is about. It's about sharing what we've learned, how we've transitioned and uh, where, where we need to go next. So my thanks to our, our presenters. Um, I just want to remind everyone we're going to take a break and then we'll have our very final uh, session um, uh, at 3.30 um, UK time and we'll be just wrapping up and looking at lessons uh, for the future. So we'll be again joined by Chris, um, uh, Professor Steve Fothergill and Dr Ewan Gibbs. So I look forward to seeing you all for our very final closing session uh, this afternoon. But thank you all for your time and uh, a very good afternoon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. OK, so welcome back, uh, everyone, to the last session of the day. It's been a pretty packed out agenda. We've had a lot of thoughts and a lot of reflections from our wonderful range of uh, speakers. Uh, taking us through our journey here in the UK from uh, from coal, out, getting out of coal. And this session is about lessons for the future. And I guess it's that one where we're tasked from the very beginning um, about finding that pathway forward. And I guess it's coming up with some sort of reflections on strategically what is the approach? Because there's so many facets to this and coming up with that, you know, and maybe there isn't just one approach fits all, but I think there are some uh, commonalities to developing a framework of action um, that that we can share from our experiences in the UK and with our, our friends and neighbours in, in Eastern Europe. So with that, what I would like to do with this panel uh, is to invite Steve and Ewan and to Chris to give us their kind of like the, the takeaways from the conversation today and the reflections and what they think um, should be some of the building blocks, I guess, for that pathway forward. And may I just remind our audience, if you would like to ask any questions, if you have any perspectives, please do just uh, raise your hand and um, we will we will get to you straight away. So what I would like to do is to um, invite Steve to, to kick start, start us off with strategically thinking through our pathways forward. OK, um, thank you, um, Tazin, and good afternoon again, colleagues. Um, I haven't sat in all of the sessions uh, today, um, so I've missed um, some of the contributions. Um, but I, I have reflected a little on uh, the session that I was involved in um, in the second half of, of this morning. And um, I recall that in that session, we, um, we talked a great deal about um, the, the, the detailed actions and, and, and timescales um, uh, for uh, you know, turning around former mining areas. Um, but the more I reflected on that, the more I, I, I thought we were missing um, one key part of the jigsaw. And I don't mean a key part of the jigsaw in terms of, um, you know, an action on the ground, if you like. But I mean, in terms of how you get there, how you 
trigger these actions? You know, how, 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 you, how you move from where you are to where you, to where you want to be. Now, I mean, in my presentation, um, I said briefly that um, there's nothing automatic about, you know, regeneration and, and recovery um, of, of mining areas. In the United Kingdom, it's been a hard fought political process to deliver um, the regeneration that has happened. And even then, you know, we haven't achieved by any means everything that we would have wanted to achieve. But, so my mind turned to, to the politics uh, of, of, of all of this and the politics that might be necessary in um, you know, several, if not all, of the Central and Eastern European countries uh, in moving forward in facing the same problems, albeit maybe on a different scale or a tighter time scale or whatever than the United Kingdom. Um, and I'm very attracted, I've got to say, to the, uh, to the merits of political organisation in all of this in terms of getting you from A to B. Um, I think what was crucial in, in the context of, of the UK was that the local authorities in the former mining areas, um, in the coal mining areas as they were closing down, um, organized themselves uh, to speak collectively and had a, you know, had a mechanism for agreeing positions and then for pushing policies and proposals directly in, into government. I mean, it was the establishment, I think, of the um, uh, of the Coalfield Communities Campaign in 1985 um, that was particularly pivotal in all of this. Now, in earlier years, perhaps it was the mining unions that stood up for for mining areas, but as the the, the workforce was um, was shrunken and, and 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 made redundant, I mean, the power of the mining unions declined. And in any case, of course, you know, they were only essentially able to speak. You know, for the workforce, the distinctive um, feature of the Coalfield Communities Campaign being an organisation of, of local authorities in the mining areas is it spoke for the wider communities and it addressed the issue of, you know, how do you go about regenerating these places? And, you know, and it posed the question uh, to central government, you know, well, this is what we need, you know, give us the, the give us these resources. Give us these give us these powers, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I think that that was a major step forward uh, in in the regeneration process in the UK. Um, it might be a useful step forward in um, some other um, European countries. I mean, it obviously depends on the on the particular local geography that you've got. Um, if your mining area is all in one small place, then you probably already have a a, a single uh, local or regional authority that will stand up for for you and, and and say what's needed. Of course, in the United Kingdom, because our mining areas were dispersed across quite a large part of the country, we did need that coming together and the creation of a of a collective voice, if you like. And if I could take this political line just just one step further, um, one of the things we did in Britain and indeed in uh, Western Europe. In the late 1980s, we created an association of uh, mining local and regional authorities across what was then the EU 15. So this is pre-enlargement, pre, -enlargement, pre um, you know, Central and Eastern Europe coming on board. We created an organization to provide a similar collective voice uh, to the European Commission and Parliament. Um, I mean, I, I was involved in, in setting that up and helped write the constitution of that organisation. I ran the secretariat for about 15 years, you know, but from about 1988 through to about 2005, it was a useful voice and it did help deliver things from the European Union. We, um, we established um, a community initiative called Richard. Um, we persuaded them that that was a good idea. Richard was about regeneration of mining areas, Rue Charbon, um, I think um, it, it would be in, in French. Um, so there were some concrete out, outcomes there too. So what I'm saying is, is it's all very well thinking in terms of technical actions on the ground, but there's almost a prior step that everybody's got to go through, which is about getting the political organisation together um, to press for those 
um, uh, political action. So that, 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 that's my thought. And that, that if I was to point to one message, I'd like to um, convey to, to colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe. I, I think it would be that political one rather than a technical or economic one. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And, and it is so important because it's that it's the it's the leadership, I guess, that's that's required. That political leadership um, to 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 mobilise and galvanise mm. around this issue. That that's absolutely vital. And and I think the other issue is, you know, we've been hearing much more about the 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 micro level things, although it's as significant as they are. But if, if we stack it up correctly, it's the macro vision it's that supervision of where this is all, all all going and and what we want to achieve and how and and then it's thinking about who's going to help us get to this vision of mm. uh of of a, a clean green economy that has to be the big picture and then the rest is a case of finding those um building blocks the enablers uh, the approach the methodology that's going to get us there and then thinking mm. about how it's all going to be managed. So we were hearing a lot about how it needs to be managed uh, carefully. Ewan, I wonder your thoughts on um, the pathway. Uh, a few, a few thoughts. Um, I think the first is the the danger of seeing competition between fuel sources, and I don't think we've done this today. But I think in public discussions. We can have it. We can see this as a competition between fuel sources or technology, when in fact it's about political economy and forms of social organisation at root. And I think um, some of the observations in the last panel, including references to Gilles's work, are, are very valuable in that respect. That we need to be aware of the social relations and coalitions that are potentially in competition here, um, especially in countries where there might still be coalitions around defending. Uh, retaining coal, coal use, such as in Poland, and I think it's it's important we think about how we convince um, partners of the, of the possibility of, of some sort of transition in which they are actually involved in shaping. Um, and that that did lead me to think about the importance of political organisation. I think Steve's point about localities is is really important. In a in a British context, I'd also say that coalitions that were formed around the coal fields or involving coal field political forces in Wales and Scotland were also integral to ultimately making the case for the devolution in those contexts. So arguments for forms of political decentralisation and then political transformation are quite important. And over a long time period, then there's also questions about how movements into and out of coal shape regional identities and, and territorial politics, which I think we have to be aware of and, and sensitive to. Um, I thought the presentation on the Big Six was, was really valuable, and that also illuminates the importance of understanding power and agency in a given political and economic context. The time period I broadly researched in, in my book, the second half of the 20th century really ends with the privatisation of um, both the coal board and, and, and the energy generation in Britain. But obviously in the current time period, questions about ownership and control are, are vital here. And, and a lot of these important decisions or, or structures of authority actually end in other countries in a British context. And that will be true across European economies in different ways. So I think it's very important we're aware of that. Um, I thought the reference to the Just Transition Commission in Scotland were important. And it is obviously highly positive that partners from industry, um, you know, business, trade union movement, the government have got round the table in that context and accepted a lot of what needs to happen and made important advances in shared language. But I also think it's quite important that we consider the frustrations of some of those partners as well, especially sections of the trade union movement who have in recent months communicated that they feel the right things are being said, but they're not necessarily being followed up on. And I think that that's particularly true in terms of stagnating employment in um, low carbon energy sectors in Scotland and not using some of those skills that that have been left over from the carbon intensive sector. And I would say that 
that relates to coal, but it, it also relates to our carbon intensive sectors like aerospace manufacturing, which are often concentrated in some cases in former coal field areas or adjacent to them. And the last thing I want to say is that I agreed with Steve's point that the future jobs don't have to be in energy or energy generation. There's, there's no particular reason to concentrate on them necessarily. Um, some of them, in some cases, they might be or ought to be, but they don't have to be. Um, but that also made me think about the major transition we've seen from, you know, I called my book coal country. If Scotland's one thing now, it's care country, and that's true of the coal fields in particular. And that, that relates to the gender distribution of labour markets and the just distribution of economic rewards, which has to be very important. And the language of just transition ultimately has to be, I think, one of economic citizenship and democracy. And the care sector is now at the forefront of a debate over economic rewards and how far we can actually trust market mechanisms or mixed economies of healthcare to deliver those sorts of rewards in a just way for both consumers and for um, and for uh, workforces. So I think it's important we consider those dynamics too. Thank you, um, Ewan. Certainly add to the to the mix of, of issues there, and and I, and I certainly like the 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 one about uh, ownership and control and and power and and agency within this whole approach and and the system, because ultimately it's those relationships that will undermine and underpin winners and losers in this game. And if we really are true to a just transition, um, it's ensuring inclusivity of voices. And uh, for, for many, it's about ensuring that diversity is Im firmly embedded as part of that just uh, just transition. And it's something that I don't hear very much about is, is how we ensure that diversity of voices, um, including the gender aspects, are, are, are truly um, uh, taken care of. But there's one other uh, issue I wonder that, that we've not talked about just now um, so far is the conflict. There is conflict of interest in this whole process um, and that we must not un undermine because th the antagonism that that conflict is going to have across multiple organisations, stakeholder engagements, um, but also as you were describing there, you and you know, it's about population dynamics. You know what? How will that um, play out in terms of um, uh, people having to move lock, stock, and barrel, losing their 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 homes and their um, uh, and their um, you know their position in society because there's nothing left as to do move out of the sector if there's nothing for them to go on to. So conflict, I think, is is really significant there. I'm wondering, Chris whether you could um, give us your thoughts on the pathways forward and and help us think through the things that we haven't touched on and some of the more challenging aspects um, uh, that that comes with this delivering this kind of like this vision of, of where we need to be in the next 10 years. Absolutely. And uh, I, hard to follow the two esteemed panelists I, I have with me because, you know, both Steve and you and very insightful remarks and um, picking up on, you know, the comments that you've just mentioned um, around conflict. And, you know, ultimately there there is a challenge, right? I mean, the, 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 I, not, things are not diametrically opposed, but, you know, transition uh, and humans in transition is <laughs> humans don't like transition. Humans don't like change. Um, so ultimately, as we go through these processes, there is going to be conflict. There is going to be challenge. And it's not just a coal picture, right? I mean, I think coal is why we're here today and coal is what we're talking about. But there's lots of lessons to be learned um, from a number of, of, of d different approaches. Um, I'm I'm a Canadian based in London. And so, you know, heavily, you know, uh, very under, well understood around the fossil fuel industry in, in, in Canada, and I worked eight six years in Alberta. And ultimately, whether it's coal in Poland or it's oil and gas in Alberta or Texas or other places like that, um, a lot of the times, you know, you have multiple generations who are in these areas, who are working in these areas, and it does become part of the culture. It does become part of the identity, um, and you know that's sort of been touched on by my two colleagues here today, which makes it more of a challenge in terms of transition. I think there are a number of individuals who are working in these sectors who understand the challenges ahead. 
they understand that despite, you know, six generations working in a specific field or a specific sector, you know, that that change is coming, uh, you know, economics is, is pushing this transition, the need to, you know, change on climate is, is, is pushing this transition as well. But ultimately, um, as much as there is a cultural tie in many cases to some of these industries, I think a lot of people get, you know, and, and this comes to the conflict that we're talking about, I think, Sometimes there's a bit of a, a false dichotomy in the sense that people, you know, are pro oil and gas or pro coal. Ultimately, at the times, and it's been, you know, I'm, I'm just repeating what what's ultimately be said today in a different way, which is it's it's pro jobs, it's pro that economic, you know, support. Um, whether and it doesn't matter in what's form. You know, we could be talking about forestry, we could be talking about other industries in certain areas, and we've all seen uh, industries collapse. Uh, being from Hamilton, Ontario, which I compare, to, you know, as the Manchester of England, you know, over the course of 50 years, you saw um, steel mills that employed over 25,000 plus uh, people in a very, in a much smaller town than it is today, you know, it's ultimately to be reduced to about 5,000. Um, and so ultimately, there's these transitions occurring. And how do we ensure that these economic supports are in place? How do we ensure that, you know, in cases where these are really good, sustainable jobs, how do we ensure that people can maintain quality of life? These are, e you know, not easy challenges to deal with. I think coming back to sort of the pathways forward um, in terms of addressing that conflict is it is about getting people around the table. Ultimately, and, you know, Steve sort of referenced in the fact that you know, ultimately some of the objectives have not been achieved in the United Kingdom, um, we may end up with that. I think there's lots of lessons to be learned in a number of situations, but ultimately it's going to be compromises that need to come to fruition. Uh, you know, ultimately governments may want to move along certain timelines. They may want, they may have preferences, as Ewan sort of mentioned, to lean towards certain types of um, energy systems versus others. I think ultimately coming to the table, these different coalitions need to be flexible in their approaches. They need to be willing to listen. They need to be willing to sort of take in a number of the perspectives and ultimately come to something that, you know, is a bit of a compromise. Um, that's why you've ultimately seen um, governments that have been hesitant to commit to 2030 in terms of a climate, you know, phase out. Germany is a good example where they, you know, ultimately with concerns, they, they came in at a 2038 target from a climate perspective. Ultimately, there's push to 2030 and other things like that. And I think, you know, you're going to see uh, economics push that transition forward, uh, sometimes not in a good way. Um, and that's why, you know, as you know, ultimately throughout the course of the afternoon, we've been talking about the importance of having a plan in place and the need to have an orderly transition um, and with partners around the table, figuring out how do we, you know, pursue this orderly transition. Um, but ultimately, I just lost the second point there that was in my head, but maybe just to sort of maybe tie things together, I think um, I really liked what uh, Ewan said around sort of um, how we go forward past coal, how we go forward in decarbonizing. I think we need to be flexible from the PPCA perspective. Of course, we, we promote a coal to clean approach uh, in terms of, you know, how we phase out uh, from coal. But ultimately, we recognize that particularly when we're dealing with de um, developing countries, which is something I spoke to on the panel this afternoon, um, or, or countries that, you know, have challenges, if we're trying to tackle this approach in a sustainable development, you know, seven goal way about universal access, you know, countries may ultimately need to go to natural gas. They made it need to go to nuclear or small nuclear reactors or other things like that. Maybe they have the potential to switch to um, uh, solar and wind and, and, and build the battery storage or they have, you know, geog geography that allows for hydro. But there's going to be many countries, and Steve mentioned this, um, you know, where there's not the perfect solution in place. There's going to be challenges. I mean, Japan is one of those countries that is thinking about, you know, it's a G7 country. It has the opportunity to do so. But because of, you know, their land mass and, and their geography, they are considering, okay, how do we how do we work through this transition? How do how do we pioneer this transition? A very difficult, it's a different situation than Canada, you know, G7 country that has most of it and has for the most of its you know entire lifetime has relied predominantly on hydro. Um, you know, whether you count that clean as not, but it's been there. And so ultimately, it's been smaller regions, less of a situation as Steve described, where the entire country is is working through a transition. But it's been specific regions like Alberta or Nova Scotia um, where you know, coal communities that have been ultimately supporting the energy systems there, uh, it's a more localized sort of transition, which, you know, 
can pose for easier transitions in some cases, but it can also pose for that conflict that we talked about when you're trying to tackle it at a national approach where it pits certain regions against others. So by no means is the path easy. Yeah, th thanks for that, Chris. And just just as you were describing that um, the scen scenario there, and and we were he hearing in the, you know, the the conversations earlier on that um, our transition in the UK wasn't driven by climate change, um, and yet you know we're hurtling towards uh, COP twenty six. Um, this is the time where the climate conversation is at its most acute and if this is not a pivotal point in which to incentivize um countries to 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 decarbonize then what will be the incentive and how do you develop a kind of like a a vision if 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 that incentive is is not there because of the the worry the the fear the fallout the, the 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 impact all the issues that we talked about during during the day because we at the end of the day if we don't have that commitment at this point in time what what next steve i'm wondering if you could give us your thoughts on on that because it does very much relate to that political drive um the motivation and it's not just about individual countries it's about countries working together uh, it's this whole kind of like collective effort and and it's all eyes are on this um now uh steve you're on mute steve, steve can i just say you're, you're on mute sorry um I'm not sure I can give you um, answers that you, you would like to hear on all of that, because it's never actually been my role in, in all of this to, to actually be trying to promote decarbonisation. In fact, you know, hands up, at various times, at various times, you know, in the past, I've done my best to defend the continuing operation of coal mines in order to preserve jobs in areas where there was high unemployment. What I can bring to the table and what I've tried to bring to the table today is some knowledge about how you pick up the pieces when the mines go and when the jobs go. Um, and, you know, that's that's what I've been directing, um, uh, you know, my, my, my attention to. Uh, you know, I fully understand why um, many people in mining areas in Central and Eastern Europe might well resist and oppose the the rundown and and, and the closure um, of um, of their mines, whether they be deep mines or or open cast uh, mines, whether they be mining hard coal or lignite. I can I can see why that happens, and I can understand why that happens. Um, I don't think it's my job to tell tell you to, to ha what the best way to head off that opposition is, um, but it's actually a very legitimate opposition. Um, you know, people don't volunteer um, uh, for their, you know, to lose their livelihoods, to, uh, you know, lose their um, identity. Yes, that word's been used, um, it hasn't it? Um, they'll only perhaps feel comfortable with it happening to them and happening to their communities if they can see that there is an alternative out there which is real and it's here and now, not somewhere way off into the future or hypothetical you know, or, um, you know, high, so high for looting that, um, you know, it doesn't actually seem d deliverable. Um, I, I spoke at an international conference on um, uh, moving away from coal a couple of years ago, and I, and I tried to make the point that, um, you know, I really didn't think that, you know, people will put their hands up and volunteer to lose their jobs. Um, there will be resistance. And I think that, you know, we just have to be honest about that. There will be resistance for good reasons. You know, um, and um, uh, it, you know, if you want to head it off, make sure there's something else for people to go to when the jobs do go. Thanks, Steve. And and I think you know, just as you're saying there, that the honesty um, that has to be integral to the conversation, and it brings in a point you and that you'd made as well about um, 
the niceties of a just transition commission, but the honest reality of how that's actually playing out and in, with reference to, to the job creation or non-creation mm. uh, uh, as we see it is it, we, we need to be crystal clear and, and open and honest about what is actually happening in terms of practical reality uh, on the ground. And if the alternatives are not there, then we need to be clear about that as well, because this is about people's lives. It's about people's livelihoods. And it's, uh, you know, there's no doubt that it will be an absolute worry and a concern. And with that, I just want to bring in a question that, that's come into the chat box from, from uh, Ailey. Um, it's a question for, for local context, but what do you believe could be done about the cultural attachment of local communities to coal uh, production? And it is that one about losing identity and, and self-worth. Um, it's, she says it's an important aspect to be, is this an important aspect to be considered? Um, and whilst it's a shift away from coal, it's essential to address that 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 change within generations and future generations to come. And people will lose their 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 identity. Um, you and I wonder whether I could ask you to to reflect on that question at all. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the first thing that's important to say is in a British context, there was a cultural assault on the identity of coal fields and coal miners in particular that we can understand as part of a broader undermining of collectivism, social democracy and organised labour in particular. And miners were seen as crucial in, in, that, in that industrial order um, that, that took shape in Britain in the period after the Second World War. Um, you know, the miners' strike was a moral conflict in that respect. Hmm. I think you and I... Uh, physically redesigned. And... I think you broke up there, Ewan. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Good. Um, so, yeah, I think that in a British context, perhaps in an American context, and, and I wonder as well in Central and Eastern Europe in the context, you know, after the fall of communist regimes and the, the articulation of liberal market economics in different contexts, coal field communities are, have been subject to a form of ideological attack already. And that that will shape this discussion and that will shape this politics. Um, I think there is a, a way to respond to this situation and to the call for a just transition, which is positive about the past of coal and and what is and, and the the contribution that miners and coal mining communities have made to the development of industrial economies, to the development of societies that have far higher standards of living than any that have, or while also acknowledging that it's not possible to go on living like this. So there's a there's a way to do that that engages those communities that involves them in deliberation over the future. Um, but I think particularly in the, the world context that we were we were talking about before, there's, there's then questions about control and ownership of that future and the distribution of economic rewards under a new energy system. Um, you know, there's, and there's a point there about the fact that it, it is control of that system would have been invested in, say, North America and Western Europe, the places that actually have emitted carbon the longest and got the wealthiest out of that in the process. And from uh, that, the parts of those societies which enjoy the most wealth from that. Um, is it going to be, you know, renewable energy firms that are headquartered in those countries, for instance, which are going to enjoy the most reward from that transition? And are they going to reward workers appropriately in Central and Eastern Europe or, or elsewhere in the world economy for that matter appropriately. I can hear Steve you're waiting to come in. Yeah, yeah. Could I just come in on this issue of identity? Um yep, sure. I think I think I think frankly you 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 won't get rid of the identity um of areas and people um that close association with, with the coal industry. There are still you know, many thousands of 70 year old men wandering the streets <laughs> or sitting at home in, in in mining communities in in Britain who still will see themselves first and foremost as miners, even though they might have been made redundant maybe 30 years ago. Uh, and um, there is still a, a tremendous community attachment as well to 
for the history of of of, of areas has been mining areas. I mean, there, there's something called the Durham Miners Gala, which is held annually, um, and it used to be an opportunity for you know the the trade union lodges from each of the mines to get together and you know have a good drinking session and listen to a few political speeches. And um, you know these days it's it, it it still continues on as an as an immense you know community festival and it's you know it attracts tens of thousands of people um, uh, from the locality and indeed further afield. Um, you know the Durham Miners Gala held every um, every July. Um, so you shouldn't expect the identity to disappear. Um, you know it will still be there, but target your efforts on making sure that there is ways of people earning a livelihood, um, even if the, you know, the, the reality of the ways <laughs> they earn the livelihood is, is that it's changed a great deal. Yeah, thanks for that, Steve. And, and, and should it even be our business to take away that identity no, and no, you know who's no, you know no, people we, we people value be, these things exactly exactly and and that's where the, the people part of this the the the, the it, it has to be ethically and morally just what what this approach looks like and it really needs to speak be true to the values that underpin this just uh, our approach to a just transition that's quite often uh, i find missing from the conversation is what does the just transition um, what is it built on? Is it built on a set of core uh, values and what do those values look like? You know, we, we we hear the issues are embedded in the Paris Agreement and the ILO and so on and so forth, but let's be explicitly clear um, uh, as to what we're, we're talking about here. But just in terms of, um, uh, you know, identity and, and 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 jobs and security. The questions that's come in from from Michael Mikhailovich is: What do you think of the idea of offering early retirement to minors in their fifties and sixties? Um, Chris, I wonder if I could ask you to to take that one. Sure, absolutely. I can start off, and then I'm sure Stephen Ewan may be able to also provide some insights there. I think. You know, one from a PPCA perspective, you know, we have a number of countries and and, and, and regions and jurisdictions that have approached um, everything differently. Um, uh, Alberta, for example, again, having spent the last six years while they sort of orchestrated its coal shift, it started, just to be clear, it started with a government policy on climate um, to align a coal phase out with 2030. Um, ultimately, actually, it was industry that pulled that forward to 2023 as of this past um, fall, and that has come with a shift to natural gas conversion. So it's not that these power plants are, are sort of are, are being removed um, on, on the mining side. That has been being wind, wound down on the thermal. There's still metallurgical coal mining in some of these regions. But ultimately, one of the key things that the government did was they did uh, provide packages and they did provide money and training for those that do wish to reskill and change industries. And additionally, I think, you know, outside of the workers, and this kind of goes to that idea of identity that's being talked about, there was also money provided to communities for community apparatuses for building and, you know, and making sure that these these towns that, you know, are, are vibrant communities, they're not, they don't become ghost towns or anything like that. I can think of actually sort of very early mines um, and, and communities that I've, been, uh, I've visited in Alberta, which don't have any miners. Yeah, you know, I think of the ghost town of Wayne in eastern Alberta, which, you know, thriving population. I think has a population of six today, um, and is, is is a tourist tourist destination. Um, but ultimately, that's that's not where we want these communities to go. Um, we want these individuals, if they want to continue living in these places, to continue living in these places. And ultimately, Steve's mentioned this. You know, what jobs are put in place, what economic supports are put in place, and so there are variable ways to uh, approach that transition. And I think across our membership, and as I've mentioned in our session earlier, those that are, you know, looking and considering how we do this, there's um, a lot of best practices that we can draw on from across our membership and, and share in terms of, you know, what me what makes sense in certain bespoke um, approaches. But I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thank you, Chris. And it's, it's, it's interesting to hear that it's, it's always nice to to hear <laughs> you know real examples because it puts things into into context it's not something that's just abstract uh, steve i can see you're you're yeah. wanting to come in here yeah if i could on this issue of early retirement um um it's been a very very useful tool in the context of the rundown of employment in in the uk coal industry 
um, and it was something that was dangled in front of large numbers of um, rather older miners and large numbers were willing to take the option. Um, it was also done, it was not just done in the mines that were closing, but it was done in the mines that continue to operate. And by creating vacancies in the mines that continue to operate because people took early retirement on favorable terms, you then were able to transfer men across from mines that were closing, you know, men that wanted to stay in the industry. I mean, there are limitations of what you can do via um, uh, early retirement. I mean, it's not obviously a solution for, for younger workers, um, you know, if there are no further opportunities for them to remain in the, in the industry. Um, but it also rather ducks the longer term uh, problem, which is if the jobs in the mines are disappearing, then there, there, there is a, a, a hole in the local economy and uh, that, you know, there are no longer sufficient jobs there for the generation behind the miners uh, to, um, to take up. You know, so the, the problem the problem is shifted you know from from the uh, from the older workers who go happily into retirement to the to, um, to their sons um, uh, and daughters because it's an issue of the wider local economy um, you know who who find themselves living in, in places where there simply aren't enough jobs to uh, uh, to go to um, anymore and so a lot of our effort in Britain as I try to explain this had to be about you know rebuilding local economies to make sure uh, not so much that the redundant miners themselves are, are okay and can find extra work, but to make sure that the generations behind them uh, in those places have been able to find work. Yeah, that's as you, and I can see you've got your hand up there. I want to come in? You're on. You're on mute, Ewan. Is that better? Yes, it is. Steve, Steve's right that. The early retirement was definitely used as a tool to make cold colliery closures less painful over quite a long time period as well. Like certainly mm. into the the seventies and then even before that. Um, and I, what I tracked in my work was that the the age at which men were offered redundancy actually declined over time. So at first it was men in their sixties, then it became men over fifty five, then it became men over fifty to create more space for younger men to take their their place as the the mining industry contracted in, in scotland and across the uk and i think clearly organizing in that way was preferable to some sort of generalized free-for-all or a way which, which wouldn't accommodate um providing retirement for some and and economic opportunities for others um, i think there were i think there were significant cultural and social costs for some of the men that took early retirement though and that that came across in several oral history interviews i completed um with references to significant increases in, in alcohol abuse um, which i don't have the, the you know this isn't something that's easily quantifiable i mean it, the records do demonstrate problems around that as well in these areas but i think the the personal stories were quite interesting and important there as well. Um, and then it was people referring to cohorts of friends who, who they'd lost. Who'd been more, and another a younger man, John Slaven, who I quoted earlier in the presentation, whose father worked at the Caterpillar Tractor Factory in the Lancashire Coalfield, he was made early retired. He was made redundant in the early 80s was economically secure, but the phrase John, John used in the interview was culturally diminished. They said he he entered a, a stupor, lived out his life in the, the working man's club and died much earlier than John thought he would have otherwise. Interestingly, John's mother, who had also worked at the factory in payroll, um, was able to find a work was able to find work in the NHS and and lived a longer, happier life as a result in his view. So I think those those costs shouldn't be forgotten. And I think Steve's point about what it means for younger workers is Hello. important too. And um, John was forced, in his in his in his terms, forced to leave Lancashire to go and work in the rail the railways in London because there was no opportunities locally at the time for somebody in his position. And that that was a more widespread development. And there is questions about 
what it means for long term, the long term creation of skilled employment in particular are relatively secure, relatively well paid jobs in an area we're just going to take large sections of the workforce out, out of play for a time period in effect. Yeah. And, and just as you're describing there, Ewan, um, I just want to, to just ask your thoughts about gender relations, because this is a male heavy driven uh, occupation. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts or any insight into how gender relations played out in terms of the man being the the in, in many cases the 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 income provider and what it what it meant for um their their kind of like agency um it, as as the the as we experience that that transition away from uh fr from coal in the uk th those gender relations are obviously extremely you know uh yeah it, 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 is, it would be interesting to know how that, that changed or played out. Steve, I wonder whether I can see you wanting to, to come in and share yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I've got some evidence on, on all of this because it's an issue that, um, you know, myself and colleagues have actually done some, some hard research on. <laughs> Not that we haven't done some hard research on some of the other issues that we've been talking about. But um, it's very interesting what's happened in the, in the former coal fields in Britain. I mean, w once upon a time, if you go back probably two generations ago there was a, um, a very clear sexist division of labour in terms of the the things that men did in terms of employment and the things that women did in terms of employment and work working you know um at home as well as um uh, as, as mothers and carers um and and so on um what's clear um is that over over the years um what was once two rather separate um, labour markets have now meshed, um, uh, not absolutely totally, um, but sufficient uh, to the extent that the decline in job opportunities for men in the former coal fields has rebounded on job opportunities for women in the former coal fields, because men, or not not so much the ex-miners, but the sons of ex-miners. Now we'll often take jobs that once upon a time would have been um, uh, taken by women. Um, you know, you will find young men who work in, in supermarkets, um, in in uh, and in the the you know, aspects of the health service, for example, in roles that once upon a time would have been, um, you know, more or less exclusively female. Um, this is, of course, not unique to the to the coal fields, but it does mean, in practice, that a job problem on the male side of the economy, you know, which is the disappearance of coal jobs, does rebound on the female side of, 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 of the labour market. And if you've got unemployment for men, whether it be on, ben, uh, on benefit or, or off benefit, it also generates unemployment for women in the same places. Interesting. I mean, it was a riddle that we couldn't understand uh, un until we worked out exactly what was going on. Um, yes, but the two are the two are now much more enmeshed than they once were. And and I think that that that, that insight is so 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 important because we are sharing our experiences, and these are lessons that you know things that have that have changed the makeup of society um, in in the in in the more coal mining regions in in the UK and how that will really out and play out in, in other parts of the world. At least we have some insight to try and um, get, you know, explain some of the, the changes in the, in the dynamics in our social makeup that, that, that is likely to come, could come, may not come, but at least we have some, some, some insight into that. Um, I'm just, I'm just thinking, um, I'm just kind of like conscious of time and what we would like to do just to kind of like close up, I think over the next uh, 10 minutes is with the task in hand, uh, lessons for the future. Um, we, we understand very clearly that there is not going to be a blueprint for, for everyone. Every country is different, circumstance is different, socioeconomics, the dynamics and so on and so forth is, is different. And I don't see we should be in a position to say you can you must be doing X, Y, and Z. But with with that in mind, how do we tread carefully and provide that that guidance um uh to to support our our our, our neighbours in in this uh, tra tra 
transition? Is it simply a case of just learn from our history or can we be absolute kind of like a bit more clearer as to do this, but don't do that? Do you see what I mean? Chris, you had your hand up first. Do you want to come in yeah, on maybe that? I, maybe I can start because I think you and Steve can probably provide some really good examples as well. But I think it, it just comes back to something you actually touched on earlier, which is the question. I know it came up in the question of the third panel today, which is who pays, right? I mean, there's an issue of not only sort of the lessons learned and how we go about it, but who pays for the transition, regardless of the plan we put in place, it, it is going to cost. And ultimately, I know there's been certain uh, planks put in place by the European Union. You know, when we're talking about the European considerations in terms of supporting uh, coal regions in transition and others. I know that the G7, as we talked about in the third panel today, is also committing money to fund this transition. And ultimately, OECD countries are going to have to help fund the transition in um, uh, non-OECD countries who are dealing with these challenges. And we, t we talked about in terms of, you know, talk about a, a sustainable approach. Ultimately, uh, I know we've talked a lot about the workers today, but, you know, the other thing that not only locally with these workers, but also sort of internationally is that the, the health, the health impacts, and the and the, the the risk impacts of climate, right? I mean, we talk about sort of the impact to the workers, but the health, the health in some of these communities for generations and generations is, you know, while they've been the the backbone of, of building up these societies, they've also been the front forefront of impacts on the health front. And um, actually, it was interesting because Ewan sort of mentioned the NHS right in the get-go from the UK standpoint. Like, how do we make sure that not only are the economic benefits for there for these communities, but the other benefits that need to be there and that could predominantly be from a health perspective. So ultimately, I think just in terms of, you know, how we go forward to this, it's not just a back best practice thing. And I've already mentioned the PPCA being an avenue to do that, but I ultimately think there's a broader role for um, rich worlds, uh, rich countries of the world who have done the majority of the impact. And I think you and mentioned that as well, you know, the back of, you know, ultimately we've done the back of um, the brunt of the damage and we've reaped the, 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 the most of the benefits as a result. So we need to rectify that when we're addressing it from a climate perspective. Okay, thanks for, for that. Chris, you and if I could turn to you before I finally come to, to Steve. I think one thing that's important is to recognise different levels and scales in this discussion. And I think we've started to do that. We've thought about regions and territorial politics, but also the importance of actors having different connections. I don't think this should be a process that relies on government. I know that, for instance, miners are actually very good at speaking to one another. And even in its current much diminished form, the National Union of Mine Workers still has connections to miners in Ukraine and on other parts of Central and Eastern Europe, and to some extent, forms of local authority connections like those that, that Steve mentioned and the, you know, European um, networks have, have helped with that. And I think that's that's a very useful way of sharing these sorts of stories and connections. And I think that more sort of peer to peer type dialogue of that nature is is useful, and especially if it is in the terms that that you refer to. Uh, before Jeffrey, in terms of recognising the legitimate conflicts of interest that that are involved in these, and I think that that seems to me um, to be centrally important, and it, and it's a it's a more fruitful way to approach this than to insist on and pretend or some sort of easy to find unitary interest in these situations. Thanks, um, you and in it. In it yeah, I can I can see the building blocks of where we need to go with this uh, next, but I'll come on to that in in, in a minute. Uh, Steve, just for your final thoughts before before I wrap up. Okay, I'm 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 sorry if I kept making contributions on so many aspects of all no, this. No, the more <laughs> I, I, well, I think <laughs> it's uh, it's probably because I've been working on aspects of this for for um, you know so many years now. Um, uh, so whichever angle uh, you come on it, uh, in, into it on, I, I, I've probably uh, done something around uh, around that. Um, but yes, at the end of the day, um, I don't, I don't think I'd want to tell colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe exactly what to do. Um, I think um, the best thing we Brits can do is to uh, offer up our experience to tell our story. Uh, which I've been trying to do. It's an interesting story because, you know, we've closed down uh, 
um, you know, one of the very largest coal industries in the world, if not the, the you know, what was at one time, the largest coal industry in the world. Um, and we have a longer history of trying to uh, regenerate former mining areas uh, than anywhere else in the world. I will say that with confidence, actually. Um, but it's really up to the colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe to decide which bits of that long story are relevant to them. Uh, because I'm acutely aware that, that the context varies so much um, from country to country, from place to place. I mean, measures that might have been appropriate in the British context might not be wholly appropriate elsewhere. It depends on um, you know, how accessible your mining areas are, how big they are, you know, whether you're dealing um, you know, with one area or, or multiple areas across, across the country, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it's really for colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe to, to arrive at their own judgments. I mean, all we can offer is, is, is the experience. Um, uh, maybe I do come back to saying, though, that if you are, if colleagues in Central and Eastern Europe are to arrive at judgments, they do need a mechanism for doing so, uh, which is why I'm, I'm, I'm such a fan of, you know, political organisation and collaboration and, and, you know, talking and agreeing, um, you know, uh, what is appropriate at the local level. But, you know, whatever, uh, whatever you do, I, I wouldn't be so presumptuous as to say, do this, do that. It's, uh, you know, that's for people to work out for themselves. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ewan, and thank you, Chris. And, uh, you know, I guess it's it's up to me to kind of summarise, if I may, um, this this really important but very, very uh, timely conversation. It's not our our job to um, to 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 say and to direct and to yeah. dictate in any way to any uh, country uh, that's represented in this conversation today about what they should and should not be doing in this process of a just transition. We we, we understand the complexities, um, we understand the, the dynamics um, and the enormity of, of the challenge, but I think what's, what's come through very carefully is how we need to um, consolidate our own position uh, reflecting on what's happening in our own countries, who's going to be affected, who's not going to be affected, and really, really thinking that through. And that has to come at a, at a country level. It has to be owned by the, the the representatives and the people in the in the countries that are part of this this conversation. Our job is to help um, guide and support and reflect and share experiences and have those conversations, have the dialogues, so that we can bounce ideas off each other. We can uh, c continue these conversations. Um, because I'm hearing that this is just the start of a of a huge conversation that still needs to take place, I, I can I can sense more dialogues coming, um, and and I think that would be hugely, um, you know, not 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 just uh, from from our point of view, act as a kind of like um a, a think thinking stop shop for 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 those who are part of this uh, conversation and maybe through that conversation and dialogue we do touch on approaches we do touch on methodologies and tools and so on and so forth those tools can be adapted and changed to meet particular circumstances um and i think we all recognize that not a one one approach uh, fits all so what i want to do is just um just to say that this has been a, a great conversation. We would love to hear more about the challenges that you have in your own nation states um, and share them uh, with us um, and see how we can continue to build on this conversation that, that we have just started. It's not going to happen overnight, um, but I hope what we have done is provided that, that insight into our history, how things have changed, how things have worked, how things have not worked, and also, you know, for you to reflect on um, our, our experiences. Um, but so with that, I would like to express my sincere thanks to all of our our, our speakers uh, today. Uh, there have been many um, and it's been really insightful. Um, 
um, my thanks to you as our delegates for uh, taking the time to be with us today and, and my sincere thanks to the British Embassy uh, in Budapest for enabling this uh, conversation to take place ahead of COP26 and we really look forward to having more discussions and, and dialogues as, as we move forward. So um, with that I would like to wish you all a very good evening and um, uh, hope to see you again uh, soon at some point but thank you for now.